Okay, why don't, uh, let me invite everyone to take his or her seat and we'll, and we'll get going. I want to, I'm Carl Gershman, the uh, president of NED, and I want to invite, uh, welcome everyone here to this meeting on the, the problems and the growing problems in the Western, uh, in the Western Balkans. Um, as some people came in this morning, Ivana was saying it was almost like a reunion for a lot of people that worked together on the problems in the Balkan region in the, in the 1990s. Um, and that seems like um, now uh, a, long, a long time off. Um, and there are other problems that, you know, are on the minds of people in Washington, in the Middle East, and in Ukraine, China, North Korea, and so forth. Um, but uh, this problem is, is coming back in a very, very dangerous way. And, you know, as we look over what has happened since the, um, since the Dayton Peace Accords a little, over, um, a, lo a little over two decades ago, there's obviously not been a solution. There's been relative stability, but no, no democratic solution, no, no real democratic consolidation. Political institutions remained weak and dominated by nationalist and populist strongmen, and societies remained very polarized, high levels of corruption, captured media, public frustration, um, and so forth. And there's also been the problem of malign foreign influence, especially coming, as we know, uh, from Russia to exploit the vulnerabilities in the region and to uh, increase the, uh, the risks for radicalization uh, and the risks not just to the immediate region of the Western Balkans, but also for, um, for Europe and for the, trans the whole transatlantic uh, area. Um, and so even though we're, you know, two decades from the Dayton Peace Accords, the, the rhetoric at both the political and the grassroots level is increasingly resembling uh, that of the uh, 1990s, the early 1990s. Um, just a few examples um, of how these problems are developing, and of course we'll have more of a chance to discuss this during the panel this morning. But in Bosnia, the, uh, the president of, of, of uh, Republika Srpska, uh, Milorad Dodic, has challenged uh, the very, very fragile constitutional order there, first by holding um, the court referendum on the sanctioned um, statehood day, um, and then um, by staging a kind of a, a lavish celebration on that holiday, which had been declared unconstitutional, and even going so far as to include in the uh, ceremonies uh, Serbian soldiers who had been integrated into a joint uh, uh, Bosnian military force, which was one of one of the successes uh, in Bosnia. But his, the effort there is to undermine uh, the integration in Bosnia. And it even appears that there's a kind of a preparation for an eventual attempt at the entity's secession with Russia's tacit and possibly even open um, support. And then there's been an escalation of not only um, a war of words and nas nationalist reinterpretations of history between S Serbia and, and Croatia, uh, but also even an arms race, which uh, Russia has contributed to by providing Serbia with six um, MiG-29s, which they're now refurbishing. Um, and at the EU-facilitated uh, level, the normalization process of relations between Kosovo um, and Serbia uh, was almost derailed uh, recently when Serbian authorities sent a kind of a promotional Russian-made train with, adorned with, with the words, Kosovo is Serbia, uh, in 21 languages, including in Albanian, uh, to North Kosovo. Uh, they, uh, the train was stopped, but even that was uh, declared to be an act of war. And the, epi the episode is seen by, by uh, many people um, as uh, an escalation of a potential Con and possible potential contest between Russia and the West over, uh, over the region. And our friend Janusz Bugajski, who is with the Center um, 
for European Policy Analysis written, wrote recently in a policy brief for the new administration that a potential, um, that there is this, uh, if the United States is going to face a geopolitical test on its strategic periphery, it's most likely to come where American power is weak, not where it's strong, and recent efforts to shore up the Baltic states through um, U.S. and NATO military deployments have increased America's relative strength in that region, but uh, less secure, though no less important, is the geopolitical theater uh, of the Western Balkans. And here, a combination of historical legacies, post-conflict vulnerabilities, uh, Janusz writes, and Russian interference should focus the attention of the new U.S. administration on an area of heightened um, strategic importance. Um, but, you know, the kind of attention that needs to be devoted to this is not just as so, so in the past uh, to preserve stability at any cost. Um, it's necessary to try to move forward uh, uh, in, in raising the bar, not lowering it for uh, uh, progress on democratic issues and establishment of democratic norms in the region. And, and to uh, have conditionality for integration into NATO and the European Union, which has not been done. Um, and the, um, the region, of course, is very vulnerable um, and to foreign uh, influence. And you know, the easiest targets for Russia in the region are corrupt politicians who remain only nominally, nominally committed to the, the democratic consolidation and membership in the EU where they might be held accountable. Um, and the West, it's essential that the West understand that the key to the long-term regional stability and security is true democratic progress in the region uh, and that the tools uh, at, at its disposal, including NATO membership, uh, have to be used to provide much needed support in this process. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why the meeting this morning is so important because we want to express our solidarity um, for the people in the region who are defending these principles, and that's essentially civil society activists and independent journalists who remain steadfast to these principles, but they're alone. Um, and frankly, they're, uh, they're, they're actually being betrayed um, by um, uh, and under attack by many of the populist governments in the region. Um, you know, they've, pra having, they've practically been wiped out in, uh, Mas certainly the media, in Macedonia and Serbia, uh, which has, where op a kind of uh, open war has been waged on critical voices. Um, and they similarly accuse, they're accused of plotting to destabilize their respective countries with the help of foreign assistance. And a, m a number of our friends in the region and key organizations are being attacked independent media in particular, but, but they remain committed to the vision of a peaceful, stable, and democratic region. Just last week, um, a group of activists gathered uh, around the Youth Initiative for Human Rights were attacked at a ruling party event um, in uh, Serbia when they protested the featured speaker, Veselin Slivanovic, Slivakinin. Uh, a, who is a convicted war criminal. Um, not only did the police refuse to provide the youth initiative with adequate protection, but local and national government officials, including the interior minister, uh, Nebojša Stefanovic, went so far as to accuse the youth initiative um, of being responsible for the incident. Um, and taking the lead from um, the political elites, the government controlled media was quick to mount a smear campaign um, against um, one of uh, the leaders of the youth initiative, Anita Mitic, who uh, was a former Hereford youth fellow here um, at the NED. Um, and they're trying to create a public atmosphere in which attacks on critical voices from civic activists to journalists to opposition party leaders um, are considered to be a, a measure of patriotism. Um, and as was to be expected, the youth initiative was indeed attacked again, uh, this time by a mob of six men who plastered the youth initiative's offices with messages of hate, labeling them traitors and foreign mercenaries. And it turned out that these attackers uh, belonged to a nationalist Russia-funded group um, that had fought 
in, um, in eastern Ukraine. So it's very, very dangerous. Um, and, you know, rather than getting support, Western governments in the region have told uh, the youth initiative, to, youth initiative to restrain themselves and not to be provocative uh, because they're making things worse from the point of view of uh, <clears throat> some of the Western embassies uh, in the region. So the kind of support that we're trying to give by having a meeting like this this morning is extremely important. I, you know, I myself have participated in three of the youth summits um, organized by uh, the Youth Initiative for Human Rights. I was there in October of 2015 in Sarajevo uh, when they had a big, a big youth summit. Um, and you know, I, when I was there, I talked about uh, the secessionist referendum that, uh, that Dodik is organizing, which was a problem back then, and also talked about the danger of Russian interference and the need for nurturing and developing democracy and a real sense of citizenship. And, and I talked about some of the programs that the youth um, initiative had organized. Uh, when it was founded, it organized a, a visitors program to have exchanges between um, young people in Kosovo and Serbia. And that has spread to the entire region. Some 15,000 young people have been involved in that. Anita Mitic herself was a product of that visitors program. And they also have another program called Ordinary Heroes, which uses art to foster dialogue and reconciliation. And I'm just absolutely delighted um, that we have with us this morning Andre Nosov, who is the founder um, of the Youth Initiative in 2003, and really one of the most uh, visionary uh, young leaders in the region, and somebody have, um, told me over the weekend, but I wanted to welcome her because the Humanitarian Law Center has also been a close friend of the NET, and in 2000, uh, we honored with our Democracy Award in the Congress, Natasha Kondich and Vetan Saroy, uh, with our Democracy Award. I'm now going to call upon Ivana to, uh, to moderate the session, and I just want to say, I think as everybody knows, because Ivana is known to everyone who's active on these issues, that she's not only a leader and inspiration in this area, but frankly, she's um, a leader and inspiration within the NED more generally. Ivana. Let's see if this is on. Yes? Everybody can hear me? Thank you, Carl, so much for this very inspirational message, and particularly for this message of solidarity and support for the work of the Youth Initiative for Human right, Rights. Our long-term grantee that is really facing some very difficult times these days, and I hope that um, here uh, as a community, we can send this message of support um, and um, uh, along the lines of what uh, Carl just conveyed. Uh, speaking of the community, I have to um, say that for uh, all the years that I've been here at NED and covering the Southeast Europe, which has now been um, over a decade, um, I, uh, it's been increasingly difficult to get attention to our region, uh, and it's understandably so, considering what else is happening in the world. Um, for this reason, I'm very inspired and, um, and, and truly happy this morning to see the turnout uh, to this event and to see um, how interested, uh, the, I mean, what a, what a significant community that's still interested we have here in Washington. I would like to take this opportunity uh, to also welcome our viewers online because this event is being live streamed and to invite them to participate in our conversation uh, on Twitter by using hashtag NED events, that's NED events. Um, and uh, I will do my best later in the uh, conversation, particularly during Q&A, to respond to any of their questions um, if they choose to do so. Uh, I'm joined this morning um, just to uh, say my full name, Ivana Cvetkovic Bajrovic, uh, Senior Program Officer here uh, at, an, at the endowment. And I'm joined here by a truly impressive uh, group of uh, analysts and practitioners, as Carl was saying earlier. Um, some voices you don't get to hear very often uh, here in Washington, which is probably in part uh, why there is such a great interest in hearing them this morning. Um, I don't really know what else to say about Andre after uh, what uh, Carl, Carl just did. I will just uh, mention that in, 
<laughs> he has a tie now, wearing a tie for the second day in a row, which is not a typical thing for an activist of his, of his kind. Um, but uh, as Carl mentioned, the Reagan for Self Fellow here today. Um, this uh, event, by the way, is co-organized co uh, between the Europe Program and the Forum, which uh, we're very happy about and are thankful to our colleagues from the Forum for doing so. Uh, Andre was also one of the uh, young leaders named um, among the 30 under 30 uh, on the occasion of Ned's 30th anniversary. And um, uh, when he returns from his residence, from his five month residence here in Washington, uh, he will go back to his position as a director of Heart Effect Fund, um, which is a foundation that uses art, theater, and film to promote some of the most sensitive issues in the region, such as reconciliation, transitional justice, minority rights, and interethnic dialogue. Um, sitting to his left is Goran Miletic, um, who is the Western Balkans Program Director at the Civil Rights Defenders, uh, as Defenders, formerly uh, Swedish Helsinki Committee. As Carl mentioned, this is a, uh, a leading human rights organization uh, from Sweden in the Western Balkans. They're both a grant maker and an advocacy organization promoting the work of uh, uh, groups and media that work on rule of law, human rights, and freedom of expression. Uh, a great partner of NEDS, uh, somebody that we really closely work with. And finally, Yasmin Mujanovic, uh, currently policy consultant with Friedrich Heber Stiftung. Uh, previously, uh, Yasmin, Dr. Yasmin Mujanovic, I forgot to say, <laughs> because he deserves that. He just earned a title last year and is currently working on, um, on his book, uh, due to be published uh, later this year. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I don't want to put him on the spot. Um, Yasmin, um, as some of you may know, if you're following him on Twitter, uh, is somebody who follows the region very closely, um, is a media personality in his own right, and I'm sure that those of you who follow the region closely have seen uh, quite a bit of him um, uh, online and on television. So the, the way we will uh, do this is instead of having presentations, we envision this as a conversation of sorts. Uh, I will ask a few rounds of questions, and I suspect this will inspire a lot of you to ask questions. So at some point quite soon, within less than an hour, I will turn over to you. Um, and I will um, begin right away with Yasmin. And um, referring back also to um, something that Carl mentioned, which is a uh, brief that was recently published by Janusz Bogajski of the Center for European Policy Analysis, uh, called Frontline Vulnerability, the Strategic Case for the Western Balkans. If you haven't um, seen this brief, I highly recommend it. It's, it's very short, but makes some very excellent points and that I might refer to um, a few more times later in the conversation. Right now, what I'm interested in is Janusz makes a case that there are two countries in the region that are potential hotspots and that give a reason for concern and deserve more attention. For him, those are Bosnia and Macedonia. I know that in your work for Freedom House, uh, these are the countries that you also cover, but you also focus on a lot of other countries in the region. Do you share his concerns that these are the two countries? What are your two countries and why? I actually do share his concern, and I do think Bosnia, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina and Macedonia are sort of the critical cases. Um, even though they are, uh, you know, I think in general conversations about the Balkans and about Europe, they're sort of synonymous with being peripheral, right? Um, but strategically and politically, I would argue that Bosnia in particular is central to our conception of the Western Balkans. And unfortunately, Macedonia is a country that is an exemplar of the kind of democratic retrenchment and the sort of broader illiberal and authoritarian turn in the region. Is it yeah. not on? It's on. It says it's on. Yes, it's on. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Is it better now? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, Bosnia and Macedonia, I do agree, uh, are the two critical cases. Um, both are frequently thought of being as peripheral, but I think to our sort of broader political understanding of the region, they are central. Um, Macedonia, because I think they are an exemplar of the liberal and authoritarian turn that we've seen throughout the region. Um, you know, a few years back, Macedonia was sort of on the forefront of the uh, EU accession processes in the region. Um, and not only has it now fallen behind, but we've seen some incredibly alarming developments uh, in, in that country over the past two or three years. We've, of course, had American and European mediators. 
Um, we've now had these elections that happened uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, the new old government has already made it very clear that they're going to go uh, very hard after civil society um, and, and NGOs, and that, that is something that we absolutely need to be worried about. Um, and then, of course, in Bosnia in particular, uh, we have to be, uh, as was mentioned uh, right at the onset, uh, I, I think the primary th threat, unfortunately, continues to come from uh, Banja Luka, from Mr. Dudik's uh, government. Uh, we have seen some of the most clear and transparent uh, direct attacks, uh, not just on the Dayton Peace Accords, but what I would refer to as sort of the broader Dayton constitutional order, which is to say the rule of law um, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, Mr. Dodik is not alone in this, um, but he's far and away the most uh, pressing threat as it concerns democratization and democratic consolidation in Bosnia. So you say Mr. Dodik is not alone in this. Can you elaborate on that a little bit so that we don't put the spot just sure on sure I mean look we've so you know we have this famous triumvirate in Bosnia right and we have uh, of course uh, on the on the Croat side we have mr. Uh, Dragančović of the HDZ um, who who is a very problematic figure um, continues to closely align himself with mr. Dodik um, but has also uh, you know kind of taken a, a pick and choose attitude as it comes to the rule of law and to the broader process of uh, reform in Bosnia Herzegovina uh, we're also currently seeing some fairly problematic uh, 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 occurrences vis-a-vis -vis his relations in Zagreb uh, who are now advocating for this quote-unquote federalization of Bosnia Herzegovina um, you know I think all that needs to be said about that is that I think it's inappropriate for a neighboring state to advocate for constitutional changes in Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, the the other, of course, key actor here is Mr. Uh, Bakir Izabegovic, um, who has also been uh, a, a key obstacle uh, to resolving a number of critical issues in Bosnia Herzegovina, in particular the question of Mostad, the Say the Chvinci question. Um, but overall, when we talk about these three gentlemen, when we talk about their three parties, uh, they act in concert, I would say. They act in concert, notwithstanding some particular objectives that they have. Mr. Dodik has his stuff in the RS, Dragan Chovic's fantasy of the third entity, uh, Mr. Izetbegovic about completely consolidating and turning into sort of a, a, a cohesive nationalist bloc, the so-called Bosniak option. Um, they act in concert to prevent substantive democratization in Bosnia Herzegovina. And I think they work in concert to keep at the margins not just uh, reform oriented political parties, but also civil society and all these actors in civil society who I think provide really critical voices as to their administration. It's interesting, uh, before I move on to the other speakers, just really quickly, you mentioned this idea of federalization. Um, Janusz Bogajski in his paper also mentions that this might also be the direction in which the ethnic Albanians go in their demands um, should uh, their demands not be met uh, in the process of government formation. Um, what, do you, what do you think of that and what do you predict may happen? I mean, look, uh, this whole talk of federalization is not federalization as we understand it, of course, right? It's, it's, it's ethnic fragmentation. Right. And by ethnic fragmentation, we also have to be clear that what we're actually talking about in practice is usually one party dictatorships de facto. Right. Uh, so when you turn what used to be fairly uh, 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 vibrant and diverse regions and you, you know, you turn each indi individual town into now an ethnic enclave, a de facto Bantustan, uh, of course, you're going to have one party rule or some kind of perverse managed democracy. Um, so I'm very, very skeptical of this talk of federalization. What we need to talk about, not just in Bosnia and, uh, and Macedonia, is about rationalization and democratization. There is absolutely no reason Right? We know this even in Bosnia. We have individual towns like Bečko where multi-ethnic governance works perfectly. So why does it not work in Mostad if it works in, in Bečko? Right? So we have to understand that these are political games. Uh, unfortunately, they're very dangerous political games. And we see the situation happening in Macedonia where the, the climate worsens, tensions build up, and then somebody you know, comes out with these bombastic populist uh, uh, nationalist pronouncements, you know, we want our own mini republic or this and that, right? It's very dangerous. Um, and I think we need to move towards substantive rationalization, democratization, and really cohesive state building, right? Not this continuous fragmentation because you're not, if you have an authoritarian political culture, if you divide it by two, if you divide by 12, if you divide it by 24, you're still going to have an authoritarian political culture just in miniature, right? That's, that's the thing. 
you, you make it, you describe it uh, as a very uh, <laughs> dire scenario. And it's interesting that a suggestion like this in a context of Bosnia specifically came from members of the European Parliament. And I think I would like to segue now into asking uh, Goran uh, about the role of the international community and considering uh, the length of, of international presence uh, in the region, uh, US and EU both, and specifically the process of EU integration. One, what went wrong? Why, why is this process of EU integration uh, not working in the Balkans the way it had worked in Central Europe? I think this is the only process that we have uh, on table. I mean, and we still somehow, uh, somehow must believe in that. Uh. <laughs> Let's make sure your mic works. Yes. <laughs> Let's try again. Yeah. Is it on? Uh, so I, I think this is the only the only process that we have on table uh, at the moment. I think battery is good. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Is it okay? Fine. Fine. Is it working now? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so I think this is the, the only process that we have on on table. However, uh, European Union is at the moment quite weak, and. Uh, Local elites understand, and politicians in the Balkans understood, understand quite well that uh, the European Union is, is weak. And now they understand and they think that the United States is weak as well. And they see that this part of the world, the western part of the world, is more or less dead or, or serious, serious, <coughs> serious trouble. So from, from that perspective, I think that they understood that the interest of the West at the moment is to maintain stable level of instability. And that the West will give some money, some good portion of money, to maintain to them. I'm talking about uh, uh, governments, all governments in the region, to maintain this level of, of stability. That's how they perceive European integration. That's the problem. And I think if we, uh, we are perceiving here European integration as some changes, as some reforms, as some uh, uh, as transition, as changes in society, but I think that elites are not perceiving like that. They are perceiving that as, as maintaining in the, on the same level, as, uh, as um, uh, 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 this level of corruption, uh, of uh, um, destroying institutions and stuff like that. So they, there is not uh, some big will uh, for reforms, and I think this is, this is the, the crucial tr trouble. What went wrong? Uh, I think uh, I think that uh, uh, in one moment we start believe that uh, governments in the region and present politicians can deliver a change without civil society. And we saw many governments. I'm not talking about U.S., but many European governments believe that we should not include civil society and other actors in, so in societies. So that only governments can deliver a change, and they are very that they are very committed and dedicated uh, to that change. I think this is the uh, the first reason. Second reason, <coughs> we didn't take them accountable. Uh, we were not clear what we expect, uh, what we expect from them, what they should deliver. If anyone, any actor is giving, like uh, European, uh, any uh, European government is giving uh, uh, some funds to some government, we didn't say what we expect from them for, for, to that fund. So it's every, everything is quite open, everything is quite general. It is not concrete. I mean, if you say, uh, for example. I don't know, reform of judiciary, what you expect uh, from that money. And that's, that's uh, the, the, big, uh, the big issue. Uh, lack of clear and strong messages to, to governments in the region is also one, one, big, uh, one big problem. We're not clear uh, at, at the end. Those messages were not str uh, strong. And they always find allies, especially in EU, that, ca that will understand them. And they have perception that they will have understand for such uh, very uh, such, uh, such bad policy. Also, I think uh, analyze and assessment of the key actors in the in the region were not done uh, were done properly. I think that much <coughs> more effort and support should be done, should be given uh, to civil society. Of course, civil society cannot deliver all changes, and it is not uh, it is not realistic to expect from civil society much. But I think uh, if you if you look uh, how support uh, went, uh, uh, governments received much more support than uh, than civil society uh, in the region. So some of the things that Goran is explaining, particularly some of the institutional weaknesses, uh, and I think Carl also mentioned this uh, in, in his address, um, are being uh, potentially exploited by some other actors, uh, external actors in this case. So uh, Russia was mentioned, Andre, um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your assessment of Russia's role is? Uh, is it a concern and what specifically is, a con is the concern? 
Um, you know, I, I uh, promoted, first of all, this uh, uh, idea that uh, we may be easily used by Russians, uh, particularly Kremlin, for any future fires in Europe as a very good and very easygoing um, material to be used. And that's very clear from, you know, you just need to read papers and figure out that this is potential. But then we come to the very concrete uh, uh, balance which we used to be having in, in, especially in Serbia, but in the whole Balkans, with engagement of United States of America, especially jointly with the EU and Russia on the other side and the other actors. We have very particular actors as China who came uh, on the board. So for me, uh, I think it's uh, the biggest trouble that the process of Russia's support to Serbian <coughs> political elite and, and institutions is not transparent. I really don't have any trouble with uh, Russian investments coming to the Western Balkans in many uh, different places, but what I have problem with is that there is no transparency of this um, of these processes. And then we come to very suspicious moments like uh, specific hu humanitarian aid center in niche. Then we come to very, uh, I will say, uh, I would say like strange interactions between uh, Russian ambassadors in the region and particular political party members and representatives. Then, then we come to the to remember the Montenegro case, which we should not forget. And I want to put very huge mark on that, which is um, the reaction and action of foreign, particularly Russian um, actors in the whole Montenegro election uh, situation. And actually, you see that this transatlantic project, which we were mentioning in the previous discussions, is somehow out of the box, uh, or people who are trying to keep up the project in the box in the region are under uh, attack. And then we come to the point of uh, media and um, how this Russian propaganda or influence of different uh, stakeholders is, is there. Um, and when you read the articles and when you read uh, examples of defending of Russia, you just need to ask yourself who attacked Russia. Then we need to have this defense in all of the media around the region. So what I'm saying is that influence and presence of Russia in the region is much bigger than even people uh, can consider, especially here in Washington, D.C., and that, and that reaction and action and actually very close watching what is going on is needed, especially in terms of attacking civil society uh, members. Uh, Carl mentioned the, the case of um, Youth Initiative for Human Rights doors, and you may say this is nothing, like they just put some papers, they said you are paid by Soros, and that's it. But the point is that those groups, when you see them on this uh, security camera, those groups and actually actions of those groups in many other countries, especially, I may use examples of Belarus, Ukraine, and, and different other, are not to be like so light as they are now on this, in this particular case. When we say light, nobody was beaten. So that's light, lightness. Um, and uh, I think we should be very worried about uh, those questions and we should be very worried for the security of particular human rights defenders and civil society representatives, even though this should not leave us um, outside of discussion how good and how, uh, how achievable are goals of many of those actors on the ground. What I'm saying is that sometimes uh, in this um, understanding of how much money goes to government and how much money goes to civil society, I would say support is needed for both sides, uh, but we should consider how we measure and how we protect what we want to achieve with this money. So this is something uh, what should be considered as well. So I think Russia is playing very, very important role. From my point of view, a very bad role. I don't want to see Belgrade being the new Kiev. So let's explore this a little bit further um, because there's uh, quite a bit of discussion, as you can imagine, here in Washington on this uh, possible role of Russia and specifically in its immediate neighborhood. Uh, but there are two events in particular or two elements in particular that you mentioned <coughs> that go a little bit further than anything that we've seen in some of the other areas, uh, of course, aside from Ukraine and what happened there. And those are the Montenegro case you mentioned and the, uh, the humanitarian base. Um, so let's start with Montenegro. 
Um, speaking about the, maybe a little bit in more detail about uh, uh, the election and the events around the election for the benefit of those who may, know not, who may not know the details, can you tell us why you have a concern that this model, uh, this approach may be applied in other elections, uh, most notably the upcoming elections in Serbia this spring? Because, you know, repeating is Balkan policy. Uh, so, you know, I really believe that one, when one thing once passed to anybody, it can pass again, especially with us. We have very short memory, not just we, but I, I would say that we live in a world of short, short man memory now. Uh, the Montenegro case is, you know, very clear with the influence of the others. And what is not clear and what we should have in mind is I'm not the one, and many people know that, who w would say Vucic is so bad and, you know, all of the election things are bad. No, I believe uh, Prime Minister of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, did some great things. And I would say we should support all of his uh, efforts to try to modernize and open or whatever word you, you want to use, Serbia. But the biggest trouble is that beyond the enemies which we see as enemies of Vucic or we can see as political uh, other political options we should speak about uh, uh, those options which will stop anybody including Vucic even some other who are much more nationalistic if they try to to push this agenda will stop them in normalization of relations with Kosovo in fighting with war crimes in finding the truth we're speaking about the whole institutional system which can be very easily as we saw in Montenegro case used by those I would say bad foreign powers to to destroy and to kind of make troubles on our future elections we still don't know who's going to be the presidential candidate of uh, Vucic party and we see a lot of messages and we see a lot of strange pressures coming especially from Russia and if you read newspapers in Serbia you, you're gonna find out uh, very particular cases I just don't want to go to details but you know we may speak about that so I, I think uh, even though every momentum in Balkans is so crucial this one is really uh, very important because this will be fight between uh, again, between two sides, as I see it, uh, on one side you have those people who, with different, I would say, the logical and political views, you know, me as a human rights activist saying for Alexander Vucic we should support him, this is kind of a strange, and, you know, somebody may say he, you know, he's paying me, or something like that, but no, I really believe, uh, you know, in the, in the situation where he was, that he did uh, some good things, and there is no reason for us not to say that where he needs to be clear is would he allow his party members to beat youth initiative activists and fight human rights activists and destroy internal democracy and on the other side go and meet uh, NATO representatives in Davos and say Serbia will move forward in collaboration and cooperation those two things they don't go together so if you ask me what is the Russian influence and what I want to see as our influence because I'm defining myself as belonging to political West, you know, I want to see Vucic on our side. So I want to see the elections and actually this influence to be, f you know, that we are aware what they did in Montenegro case, because no one believed. If you remember, we had small debate similar to this one just right after Montenegro elections. What we spoke on the meeting that day happened to get out on media two weeks later which is strange, we are not people with a lot of access to any security details, but it's very strange that for everybody this very open action, and that's a new model, in a way open action happened there, and I think we have those open actions all around. So, from my point of view, I think uh, it's very important not not to leave the elections and not to leave the electoral process in all Western Balkans. We're going to be having very soon uh, other countries' elections as well. This is momentum when, when all of the countries need to have a strong watch from here. And that's, that's very important. So could this threat go a little bit further? Like uh, Carl has cited Janusz Bogajski who says, um, that this could be the area that could, where the U.S. could face a geopolitical test. And, um, specifically, you mentioned this humanitarian base in south of Serbia. 
Uh, by all accounts, this base um, could be a little bit more than what it appears to be from the outside, and there could be others actually and in Serbia. So I'm curious to explore. I mean, I know that a lot of this is speculation, so we'll we'll yeah. preface it with that caveat. Mm -hmm. um, but is this a concern to you personally? It is. Uh, I would say today we have in Brussels meeting of uh, Prime Minister Vucic and Mustafa, and we, uh, they discuss, they follow up the Brussels dialogue on Kosovo-Serbia relations. We will see what will become, uh, what will be end of uh, of this discussion today. But in these predictions, or however we want to say it, uh, when we speak about this specific niche uh, building place space, however you want to call it. Uh, I never been there, but uh, it's a neighborhood of my home. Part of the land is actually used to belong to some of the family members. And you know, when you see it, it doesn't look like humanitarian aid center. And it's very nearby Bonstil, and it's very nearby Kosovo. And uh, you know, I can give you like this, like hundreds of arguments why this is suspicious to me to have it right there and requested on the north part of Serbia as well to have kind of a branch of the niche one. So if uh, any of the Serbian governments were doing decentralization and you had a lot of requests, Russian did it. So they have their center in niche and in the north part of uh, Serbia they, they are asking for, for other. And for me this is seriously threat because you know people who were there and the footage which I saw is just saying that there are some bigger engagements than humanitarian aid to Syria and and different other things. So what I'm saying is, uh, when you when you compare this engagement to the engagement of '99, 2000, 2001, even 2005, even the momentum of arresting Radovan Karadzic, you know, you see much more open and much more, how to say, visible actions of different actors concerning not just niche, but different other things, you know. And we may speak about those. I was spending my time here at NED researching specific soft power mechanisms which Russia used, not just in Serbia, but in many other countries, which are used to be seen in a Cold War, you know, as a mechanism of uh, propaganda or uh, different other actions. What I'm saying is we should, you know, pay much more attention on the specific details and not leave small actions of different actors to be unseen because that's the biggest problem as I said in the start it's not problem that some foreign country we have many others we have the other investors in invest in Balkans like Saudi Arabia Belarus Kazakhstan many other countries and I'm and I'm using them as example because it's not just question of of Russia it's question of many other non-West countries which are coming there on board. And it's a serious question for Washington and for Brussels and for many other countries why Serbia and why Western Balkans countries are turning much more to the other side than to this side. What is the problem? And I see that the problem it is in us, but as well there is a problem in lack of willingness and understanding how to support and how to finish job because that's the key issue. We still didn't finish job there. and. We are in the last moment of making our cake, and then somebody came. Somebody may come and destroy the whole cake with very bad sugar on the side. Mm -hmm. You're going to make us hungry before our lunch is served. Um, I would like to go back in a minute to this, uh, uh, what you just mentioned about other influences and other and presences of others in the region. But let me uh, actually ask Yasmin. Um, Andrei spoke about Russia mostly in context of Serbia. Um, but I think it's safe to assume that this is not yeah. just the only country in which uh, Russia has its uh, interests and uh, strategic interests. Uh, how do you see Russia's role in some of the other countries, Bosnia or even Macedonia? I mean, there was a point that was raised earlier that I think really needs to be reiterated, and namely that's that as far as the Balkan elite wholesale are concerned, there is now a widespread <coughs> perception that the Euro-Atlantic project is over, mm. right? After Brexit, after the election in the United States, this is done. I mean, whether the EU unravels tomorrow or whether it unravels 25 years from now, those seeds have now been planted. Uh, you have an administration in Washington now that is signaling uh, that it apparently wants to disengage from NATO. Um, 
it's possible that NATO becomes, you know, a German-led alliance rather than an American-led alliance. Um, but that'll be a huge transition. Um, and we, you know, we, that, that, that would be a long process. And in that interim, those local elites in the Balkans, the one thing that they have always been historically very adept at is figuring out when the ship is sinking and getting off, right? That's how we see the exactly the same people that were in power in the 1980s, right, that were all loyal communists are now loyal nationalists, Western, whatever, you know, whatever they want to label themselves as, but it's literally the same people, right? They have a kind of elastic authoritarian methodology that they're very good at uh, 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 employing and deploying. Um, so they're, they're looking for new partners. They're looking at the Russians uh, in particular. Um, and as it concerns the Russians, I think vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with Serbia, in Serbia, Russia sees a relatively stable partner. But Russia's methodology and uh, how Russia leverages its actual sort of hard power disadvantages when compared to the United States and even to the EU is that it finds these marginal cases. I fully expect that in the next year or so, we're going to see a much more explicit alignment of the <coughs> government in Skopje with, uh, with Russia. Um, and uh, we know that uh, the Dodik administration in Banja Luka and the Republic of Srpska entity in Bosnia Herzegovina is desperate to become a satellite of Russia. I mean, they they can't help themselves how much they want it, right? I mean, every every third week there was a period where Mr. Dodik was either saying he was going to Moscow or he was in Moscow, right? Uh, I think the Russians are not that interested in the RS per se other than understanding that this is you know a potentially a potential flashpoint so right now i think they're just kind of throwing them bones um but in the next uh, in the next few months and possibly in the next year or two i would not at all be surprised to see the russians make a much more serious play there because you have to remember towards the end of uh, 2014 and going into 2015 before this whole holiday uh, uh, fiasco and, and referendum uh, 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 circus in, in Bosnia, we had a much more alarming situation, which was when the government and the RS decided to momentarily pull out of the central police structures in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And we were this far away from an actual shooting incident between the state police and the RS police. Um, that was incredibly alarming. And I think that was a wake-up call to many people in the international community who dealt with Bosnia. Um, but that was, that was incredibly alarming. And, and I would, I, I'm very, very afraid and I'm very concerned um, that that kind of situation can and will play out again, and that the next time that it plays out, that the Russians will step in and, and feed that fire. Um, and that would be, I mean, that would be disastrous, not just for Bosnia-Herzegovina, it would be disastrous for the region. Um, whatever we may believe, Bosnia-Herzegovina is the strategic and political core of this region, I maintain that. Um, and we're in a situation now, unlike in the 1990s, uh, where any kind of instability in the Balkans, serious instability cannot be contained, right? It won't be like the 1990s because you have the wholesale unraveling of the Middle East. You have Turkey in a headlong rush to autocracy. The membrane, which is the Western Balkans between the core of Europe and, you know, utter chaos in the Middle East is the Western Balkans. And these democracies are failing. Right? So that is why the stakes at this moment are incredibly high, even if we're still largely talking about, you know, as Andre was saying, kind of games in the shadows. Wow, I think this is going to inspire quite a few questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave it right at that so that others can ask, uh, probe this more. Uh, Andre mentioned uh, some other influences from uh, foreign government influences, and I think that some of those may come as a surprise to some of the people in the audience. I think Azerbaijan was mentioned, Kazakhstan. Uh, I think the Gulf states, uh, I think, are a more obvious one. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, Goran, about, about the presence of these countries, how it's manifested, and to what purpose? Yeah, I think we underestimate the uh, influence of those countries and especially and especially Russia and we need to analyze and it's very simple to analyze. So all those pro-Russian forces and let's say it's not pro-Russian, I mean Russia should be respected, but pro-Putin pro -Putin forces, what they offer uh, not only to Serbia, to, 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 def to their allies in the region, what they offer, what's the key message of them? 
Apart from messages like no abortion, no gay prides, or stuff like that, we, we should you know skip it. That's that's the usual thing. But what they, what they are demanding, what they are telling people, no EU. That's the only thing they they are they are always promoting. No EU. We should not enter EU, and we should not adopt any EU values and EU reforms. That's it. That's what they what they demand, and that that's their message. I don't see nothing much ex except that. Uh, from them, so this is something what is uh, what came from Russia, and I think the similar uh, the similar message and similar influences are coming from China, from Azerbaijan, from uh, now Kazakhstan and other Belarus, especially they are very they are very active and they are very big friends, especially with Serbia and at the same time with, with Dodik. I mean, it is it is very uh, interesting how they play, and they are they are uh, promoting the same the same values actually actually Russia and coming with the with the money. With some really uh, big money, and they are uh, and they are doing and they are delivering something concrete. Is it road or bridge or something else? But for people, this is something very very positive. And then when you when you look at the opinion polls, people believe uh, first of all, I mean maybe Serbs in in uh, in, uh, in Bosnia and also Serbs in Serbia, some in uh, in, uh, in Montenegro as well. They think that uh, they want Russian values. They want to live in EU. But they want they want Russian values, and if you ask them who is supporting Serbia the most, they say Russia. They don't say EU or United States. They say that the biggest supporter, financial supporter to Serbia is Russia, and they uh, while Russia is giving almost zero uh, zero donations to uh, to Serbian government and so on. So we, we I mean I think that <coughs> are very successful at the moment. Their their influence is very is very good and very successful. They are doing it in very right uh, uh, in right way. They are very cost efficient. They are giving a small small amount of money, but they are, they are getting uh, they are getting a lot. Uh, I think that uh, those forces are now becoming more and more more and more serious because at the, at the very beginning we underestimate them. And what you can read in uh, especially in Serbian media, but also in other media in the region, are that uh, uh, state is, is more or less collapsed. I mean, more or less, United uh, EU is also is also quite bad. But on the other hand, what you what you are reading about Russia is uh, the yesterday I read in Blitz that is big biggest newspaper in the region, I think, and they say this is the this is the aircraft uh, because of uh, NATO generals are shaking, so they are presenting us some new uh, new uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, plane that is not made yet. It's just, it's just plain. <coughs> they, say, they say that that NATO generals are shaking because of that of that plane. That's quite uh, that's quite a usual message. They are promoting all Russian something new from Russia, uh, boat or anything, and they are saying that this is really wow and everything that is happening in Russia is very positive, while everything is coming from West is is uh, negative, more or less. More or less, and uh, they are of course promoting. Uh, uh, I must say that, but this is this is true. They are promoting Trump. They are promoting uh, uh, Le Pen. They are promoting other some some usual uh, usual guys as the friends of some of some uh, some uh, political circles uh, in the Balkan. And I think it's quite. They are connecting those circles with with, uh, with Russia, and this is the this is the what we have it what we have on table. I think this is quite uh, dangerous on on the long run. I don't think uh, that war will happen. I don't know something like that in uh, in I don't know three years or five years. But I think some small incidents, like uh, small, not small, not so small incidents, like we had in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, from my perspective, this is extremely dangerous, and I think that this can happen again. And I think that uh, reaction of uh, Western countries at the moment will not be that good. Good. I mean, at least partially good as we have like three or five years ago. I think it will be much more slower and because all politicians know that uh, Brussels is more or less blocked and they just want some kind of stability. So I'm very, very much afraid uh, what will happen uh, uh, with, that, with that scenario and I think that Russia is playing excellent, uh, excellent game from that perspective, Putin is playing excellent game and if you don't agree maybe you should just w watch the example of Transnistria in Moldova. I mean it's not that close, I mean and they, they don't want to have Moldova <coughs> part of Russia, which is the same with the Balkans, it's a, a bit far away from Russia. But still, that influence is, is, is good enough to block, uh, to block, uh, to have a kind of frozen conflict or frozen, frozen instability, let's say, uh, frozen instability, which is very good uh, from uh, from Russian perspective. And I think that they will play, they will Putin will play on uh, on that role. And I think it's very, uh, it's 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 time to act at the moment. 
Before I turn to uh, my last round of questions, uh, Andre sounded like he wanted to say something, <laughs> right as, as other countries were mentioned. I don't want to put China in the same portion as Russia because the mechanisms are different and uh, the, the reasons and motivation is completely different. Uh, I would say that China is having bigger interest in Europe uh, than before and uh, in Belgrade, and I'm very happy as a theater person, we're going to be having the huge, the hugest Chinese cultural center uh, with the amazing plan for 100 years. I never saw that any cultural institution make 100 year plan. They did. And, and you know, we may laugh, I did the same, but this is like something very serious because um, my problem is not that so-called enemy in this case is making plans. My problem is that we, on the other side of the enemy, are not having plans. And that's something what we should think about and work on that because I, in the last 15 years of my connection to Washington DC, I don't remember any other time when Washington was so not worried for Balkans. Um, you know, this full room makes me more than happy after four months in DC. Uh, what I'm not happy about is that I know half of the room, but <laughs> you know, this is something what really we need to think. Who, is Amer who are American people on the ground? On the value base, I'm not speaking working for United States, but to whom, let's say, democracy uh, uh, people around DC or people who were promoting those values can connect with? Who are those people? Are they exist? What is the, 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 the investment from here in those people? I would just remind you of great achievements of the United States of America in bringing to justice, I will not speak about the justice, we can reevaluate that before on, on ICTY, but the whole action of bringing criminals in front of the justice. It was impossible. I remember I was in this, this particular room in 2005 and some of the people around the room were as well here. We were discussing arresting of Karadzic and Mladic. It looked like it will never happen. In the end it happened. What I'm saying is there are models, there are mechanisms. We just don't want to use them because, because of something what I really don't get in the particular Balkan case. I can get the change of the policy and all of that, but you know, it's time to evaluate this change. I believe. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I just very quickly want to bounce off that point. Uh, the thing that the policy paper that that you've mentioned a number of times now, I think, makes a very strong case for something very specific, and it comes out of Andre's comments as well, namely that actually a relatively small investment, not just in hard power but in soft power in this region, would pay tremendous dividends. We, I don't think, uh, people both in Brussels and Washington appreciate how much of a perception there is in the region that Europe and the United States have disengaged, right? And so I know this from, 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 you know, from, from working in Sarajevo in particular. There is still a kind of, I don't want to say awe, but there is an incredible amount of seriousness and respect when the United States acts. Just a couple weeks ago, we saw the Treasury Board finally sanction Mr. Dodik in particular for clear violations of the Dayton Peace Accords, right? This was a major, major move, right? It was a small move, but it has already had major, major effects. And I'll tell you exactly how we can measure that. Mr. Dodik, who's very famous for his very boisterous and braggadocious kind of style, when that decision came down, was MIA. There was no statements. There was little things leaking out here and there, but he basically came out and said a couple days after the fact, well, yes, I expected this. There was none of the, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna build an army, we're gonna build an armada, you know, none of this, it was gone. What was also very important was that there was next to no comment from Mr. Dragonchovic of the HDZ, and Mr. Bakit Izabegovic as well came out with a very, uh, very sort of limp statement that's, yeah, you know, it's, this is very bad for Bosnia, you know, we're all very embarrassed. 
it showed you how much of an effect that had. Because financial leverage, which is something that can be done very, very easily, both by the EU through money valve programs, anti-corruption, anti-laundering, right? Which is also incidentally why these political elites have resisted those programs the most. Um, has a huge, 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 huge effect, especially in places like Bosnia and Macedonia, where there is a, an actual architecture to employ these things, but in the region as a whole. We mentioned yesterday, we remembered, and I think in the context of ICTY cooperation, the Lautenberg provision, I think some of you in the room may remember it, which basically used this very tool of conditioning, uh, yeah, I'm looking at the person right now, um, <laughs> which basically used foreign aid, development aid, um, as a leverage to make some of these changes. And I, I'm glad that you both segued into this last portion of our discussion, because this is Washington, after all, and people like ideas and suggestions here. Um, so what is your suggestion on the, based on the lesson that we have now for uh, from the these sanctions episodes, to call it that, um, what what would you suggest to policymakers? I, I mean, in the interim, uh, I would hope, and one of the things that I've in in my very limited capacity, what I've been pressing for is that I would like to see the Europeans get on board with these sanctions, uh, if not the EU as a whole, uh, then individual countries. It would be great if the UK could come on board, Germany in particular. Uh, that and they need to be maintained. Right, they need to be maintained until we see credible, serious movement towards reform. I mean, today we saw a headline in the Bosnian newspapers that Bosnia received the EU questionnaire a couple months ago. The RS institutions have not filled out a single question. That's unacceptable, right? I mean, at the very least, freeze the process right there and then, right? Which includes also cutting off the money. That's what, would th that's what we need to finally get around and understanding that these uh, countries are completely dependent on Western monies in terms of credible projects. As was said, Russia is providing actually zero money. If they want to play that game, fine, go to the Russians. See if they'll give you the money. They won't, right? And then you put them in this impossible po position. Th B aside from that, though, these particular sanctions need to be maintained on Mr. Dodik. Uh, they need to be expanded as needed to r the other members of his cabinet. They need to be potentially expanded also to Mr. Chovic and Mr. Izetbegovic. If we want the Say the uh, 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 uh question to be resolved, if we want Mostad to be resolved, it's unacceptable. People in Mostad have not m voted since 2008. It's not even no longer a managed democracy. It's just not a democracy. And now we've seen that spread to Stolitz, right? It, it's, it's farcical. Um, so this is, this is a very credible mechanism that can be used, should be used, and will get effects. It's, it's already had effects, right? So there was a time when, when a tool like this really would have made the difference potentially, and that was at the time where the IMF loan was be being decided. And I know that what happened um, around that time uh, is a matter of symbolism that youth find very important, and that is in how the EU and US engage with local actors. Um, so tell us what irritates you in particular, and what would you like to see going forward? So this is going to sound like a bizarre pet peeve, but it's really, really not, right? So we have this incredibly problematic tendency in the region. It's especially bad in Bosnia, but it's a regional thing, where major political summits, including those with international representatives, happen in restaurants. They happen in hotel bars. They happen, I kid you not, at gas stations with restaurants attached, right? Middle of nowhere, outside of public view, outside of parliamentary institutions, uh, outside of media attention. This is unacceptable. If you're going to have any serious policymaker coming, especially on an official visit, this needs to happen in official institutions. There needs to be clear documentation of what was discussed. I mean, I understand the need for closed door meetings, but please, uh, there needs to be memoranda released to the media and to the public, right? This is an incredibly important. Uh, 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 symbolic investment in the legitimacy and credibility of democratic institutions in a region where those institutions are still incredibly weak, right? And especially when you decide to make major moves like we're going to give you an IMF loan. Please do not negotiate an IMF loan at a gas station, right? Which is what because, <laughs> because all it ends up looking like is hush money. Right? This is, I mean, this is going to its point about this, like, stable level of instability. Like, please, 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 please don't start a war. Please don't start a war. It's, 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 it's absolutely horrendous. And the way that it undermines public, uh, 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 public perceptions of the United States, of the EU, of the broader or what remains of the Euro-Atlantic project is, is incredible. It's devastating. 
Okay, I hope this note has been taken by some of the folks. We didn't mention We're Kosovo at all, but this is important. Uh, uh, Goran wanted to um, say something to before. One, uh, I think good example, Andre man mentioned justice. And uh, it's very interesting. I mean, I agree that this should be priority in the region, everywhere in the region, no country in the region. And uh, when I'm talking to some friends, you know, we have said, well, but United States is very stable. They have stable institutions and free elections and stuff like that. And part, the key part of stable institutions is always judiciary. And we want that in the Balkans, so what? And at the moment, of course, we are investing a lot of money. United States is investing a lot of money. European Union is investing. Countries, uh, countries are giving a lot of development aid in that regard. And what the EU is doing during negotiation? They say, OK, we now op open Chapter 23, which is judiciary, including human rights and judiciary. And, but we, we, this chapter will be the last that we will close in the, in, the, uh, in the negotiation. What that exactly means? That means, OK, you start. Uh, reform now, and you will finish it in 2025 or later, because countries will enter it later. So what what they are doing on the field? They know that they should do nothing. They will not do anything. I have uh, members of my board visiting uh, visiting Serbia, and then there was several lawyers in the board, and then they ask, okay, but what about judiciary and reform? And then uh, minister for uh, European integration say, yeah, we have we have a plan. You know, my Swedish colleagues are very happy when they heard that there is a plan, and they say, well, in 2019 we will uh, adopt new constitution, and you know, in 2000. 19, I mean, new constitution, and then after that, we will start a reform. And then one colleague asked, but what, what citizens will do until 2020 something? So this is, this is the way they are thinking. They are trying to avoid reforms, and I think, for example, judiciary, reform of judiciary must be done yesterday. Yeah. And not wait, you know, another five years, and, uh, and that's really a big problem. And if you ask me where this enormous amount of money for judiciary is going, it's, it's horrible. I mean, they are, I agree that we need to have buildings and stuff like that, but they are going basically to some lovely buildings while what is happening inside the building is absolutely not, uh, not in focus of any, uh, any development aid. So, Andre, I know you wanted to say something. Try to stay on this track of um, yeah, well, sending will. a message so that we can wrap with I that. Will. But we should have in mind that if we want to have constitution earlier, there is a need for political consolidation in Serbia. So what I'm saying is we should not forget we are always speaking about the public things which we get from media, from all of the public events and all of that, but we should not forget very strong influence of those let's call them dark forces, which run Balkans for last 25, 30 years. And I'm speaking about unreformed security services, unreformed arm and parts of the armies or whatever you want to call some of the uh, uh, military forces which are existing there. And don't forget that in many countries, especially in Kosovo and Bosnia, we have a lot of guns in possession of people and all of that. This is real and serious security threat. So in many of those cases, when we want to see some reform, if we want to be fair enough and just enough, we should say uh, the threats coming from the institutions are not just lack of the will of political elite to deal with some issues. We have serious resistan with resistance within the system. And what we should do there, we should work on the target which is key target and key target in this case is deal with those issues and deal with those people who were involved even in very massive crimes in 90s including genocide we still didn't uh, focus on how to build our institution with a little bit of uh, dignity for the victims and a little bit of dignity for the reform of the institutions and having in mind the background of our prime minister and the most popular political party in Serbia, and having in mind what happened with all of the, let's say, non-conservative votes in Serbia, but the similar situation is going on in all of the other countries in the region. And let me just, the last thing, what to do there, we have this train, and, you know, let me tell you, I wanted small train here today, but even I didn't allow me, like a small <laughs> childish one that I can play game. Uh, and this game about train made us uh, in a position to see that it's needed just one afternoon to unfrozen this conflict. Uh, and that it's needed somehow to be aware that all of those softly and easily fixed things in the Balkans, which what happened 
in many cases, celebrations over agreements and many other things are not actually fixed. They're just covered, like, you know, like when your parents are coming to visit your student room. <laughs> so... So your suggestion? Suggestion is we need to work on that. We need to uncover that <laughs> and say to parents, that's it. <laughs> True and comprehensive reforms, cleanup, yeah. true, and, true yeah. and comprehensive cleanup. Support actors, actually, uh, to be precise, I think the political West should pay more attention and support political actors, critical ones and those who are trying to do stuff. There are people, even within political option, which is not my option, you know, which is not something where I will ever vote for, but we should be realistic and we should say, those are people doing good job. Let's help them. Okay, more explicit support, moral and financial, I assume. <laughs> Any kind of support. I think this is what Carl did in the start of uh, this event for Anita, Youth Initiative, and I assume activists from all around the Balkans for Youth Initiative are watching this, is very important because, you know, this feeling, I was in this situation so many times, this feeling that you're sitting alone in your room, in your office in Belgrade, and somebody is putting, you know, uh, money, like fake money, US dollars, I hope it was r proper money, but it's not, uh, in front of your doors, it's really bad feeling. And I think that we should consider rebuilding the solidarity actions. And it's not just a question of money. You know, everybody would say there is no money in Balkans. There is no maybe money like in 2005 that you can open office with 25 deputy chiefs, <laughs> but there are uh, enough sources, I would say, for action, which is important for critical, of critical and very, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, important allies of the value system where we want to be and where, where we want to belong. So ambassadors, act different actors should support those people. You know, Biden was there. He didn't meet any opposition. He didn't meet any critical voice. He just met the governments. So is that the message of the United States of America? I've been convinced by several members of different institutions here that this was like something. But then after that, we had a couple of other delegations, a similar situation. Why? Is that opinion? Is that statement? Is that something? It is. And it sends very strong message that those are actors are left alone. And I'm going to ask you, you know, NDI and I, I did great work in many political parties in, in reforming them, in why they are not more there, you know. And I know they're going to say, I know their answer directly from them, but that's a question for bigger, you know, uh, consideration than, than we can have. Like, are we really believing there is no need to work with political parties in Balkans anymore? You know, we have to. I'm watching in you. I don't think my colleagues from uh, the political party institutes think that it's no, no longer uh. needed. I'm going to put my glasses on, hoping that I can recognize some of the folks that have, uh, and I think Professor John Lampy had his hand up first. Uh, I will ask just uh, really quickly for some protocol here to introduce yourself and the institution you're representing. Um, please, if you want to make remarks, this is fine, but as a moderator and a, and a tough one, as this is my reputation, I reserve the right to interrupt you at roughly five or so sentences. I have a question. <laughs> Here come the uh, <laughs> it's all script, handwritten. John Lampe, uh, Wilson Center and former East European Studies director, author of, with Leonard Cohen, of Embracing Democracy in the Western Balkans in 2011. <laughs> Thinking like a stone. But anyway, appreciating <laughs> this, this meeting to talk about an area that in our presidential campaigns and in the, the new administration is not a word, never mentioned. But never mind, let's mention it now. And what I want to mention, uh, and, uh, uh, and in line with some remarks I'll make at the Wilson Center next week on uh, Wednesday on uh, Bal my, my Balkan uh, update, I was at the Balkan Security Forum in October where we had this love fest between Rama and uh, Vucic. Uh, and both of them saying, we don't expect this UN, uh, EU membership soon, but uh, the process is important. It's so valuable. We're going to keep doing it. We're going ahead. Uh, and then this appreciation from the American embassy and representatives and 
uh, Misha Glennie pointing out in his uh, Vrema article that, well, yes, this, uh, the, this, is the, this is the American favorite. And so the, the question I have for the group is, uh, uh, what about this Vucic option that he's playing in this EU process and American direction versus what I heard was Nikolic and people around him uh, inclined toward the Russian option and the Serbian uh, public divided between them, mainly concerned that that awful Hillary who bombed us wouldn't win the election. Uh, but in any event, uh, uh, is there some uh, uh, a premium in uh, going ahead with uh, uh, the Vucic option or are there such objections that uh, I'll be swept aside? I think we'll have some disagreement on, uh, um, well, we have quite a bit of time still left, so I will go ahead and let you respond, and towards the end, if we see that we're running out of time, we can group the questions together. Um, Andre, go ahead. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, you I know, say there's a little bit of disagreement here on the stage on, on perhaps how the question will be answered, so we'll see if we get to see that or uh, not. And I love this debate, and I think you're going to love this debate. Uh, <laughs> But the whole point is, yeah, of course, Vucic Nikolic in that dilemma which you mentioned, that division, we, we are watching right now, right here in newspapers, like this morning, uh, some strange things. Like, for example, you have v uh, Nikolic, um, uh, and I'm giving just those small details just to show the, the, the plate where we are for those people who are not covering very closely. W we are expecting decision to see Will Vucic be presidential candidate? Will we have parliamentary elections? Uh, would Tomo Nikolic stay Vucic candidate? And who will be on the other side? For now, we know there are two candidates. One is known to you, Vuk Jeremic, our ex-foreign minister. Uh, and the other one is Sasha Jankovic, uh, the ombudsperson who said he's going to put his candidacy. And we still don't know what's going to happen no, with... No. Sheshel is there, but I'm not counting him. But it's very important. Uh, and then we come to Sheshel. What's going to happen in the second round? Would we have Vucic and Sheshel? Would we have Toma Nikolic and Sheshel? Is it possible that Vuk Jeremic can go to direction to be Vucic and Vuk Jeremic? Can then opposition deal with that to support Vuk Jeremic? Will Vuk Jeremic be Vucic candidate? No, maybe Vucic is not there. And a lot of things we can read in all of the media. But the whole point is, there is a clear division in the policy level between president and prime minister. And it doesn't mean they're not together. They're not trying to stay together. They're not hoping to stay together. But there is a division. Tomo Nikolic is much more on this, I would call it, traditional nationalistic uh, type of policy. And Vucic is trying, with, even with this Rama case, to be on the other side. So is there a division among voters? There is a division among MPs. So everybody who is saying Vucic is having all power should keep in mind that part of the MPs are belonging to the policies and values of Toma Nikolic. So we cannot speak anymore about absolute power because this is not right. He is not having absolute power. Why he would need to have two-thirds of the parliament to change constitution. And we need a change of constitution if we want to join EU. How are they going to do it? What is the way to do it? So there are many of those questions and many answers. But I would say, if you ask me what to do with Vucic when he is attacking human rights activists, beating uh, you know, people, uh, y you know, a lot of those things, I think we are watching the policy where for the public, especially international public on Belgrade Security Forum, with his friend Rama and in their joint action, they support each other. But then on the other side, and he's doing some great stuff in work with, with, with him, like for example, establishing youth uh, regional office for exchanges, some reconciliation mechanisms, there is a truth commission and all of that. But then he come back and say, all of those people who actually and you know who created Raiko Idea, this regional youth office supported by Vucic and Rama? Anita Mitic, who was attacked in Beshka, mentioned in the start of Karl's speech. She was the one, and the youth initiative was the one from 2003, requesting that type of office. 
all the time. So you have those who created this policy being now attacked in Serbia and they actually created some positive policy for Prime Minister. So what to do with him? My option and my choice, according to all of the arguments which I have, is even all of those attacks, even all of those things where I disagree with him, having in mind political reality, I think we need to be clear and say there, those are good things, those are bad things. And we should support good things and say for bad things, they are bad things, we do not support you there. We're going to strongly disagree on attack of human rights activists and media. Because any other option in which we believe that, you know, I don't know which, uh, which of those kids' stories I'm going to use as example, exist in Serbia and in Serbian politics, or in any other politics, is really unrealistic. You know, I know that some of the basic values for people here or in many West countries, it's not clear how those people cannot have them, you know. We were discussing yesterday corruption, that, that's a good case, and I ask you, how do you define corruption? Because that's something what we also need to consider in evaluating those politicians, evaluating what they do. Because there are many different, um, how to say, uh, reasons why they made this or that decision. What I'm saying, I think we need to work with him. Got him, oh, well. <laughs> Here it goes. I Here must it goes. Sure. <laughs> Here it goes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with the assessment about uh, when, we are, when we are making division between Nikolic and, and, and Vucic, that's fine. I'm, I'm fine with that division. But I'm um, judging every, every politician or every, everyone, every, especially not politicians, but people that are uh, in the government. I'm judging, uh, uh, having in mind what they, what, they are, what they are doing. And I have the same, the same thing. They are accountable. I mean, uh, we have executive branch, we have uh, judicial branch. They are accountable for, for many things, that are, for all things that are happening in the country. If human rights defenders are attacked, I mean, they are accountable. We need to, we need to very proper investigation. We need them to bring to justice. And it's, it's very simple. We know the procedure. We, mu we know uh, what must be done. In this, the last case about attack uh, on initiative, they start attacking new initiative on, on TV. Instead of having investigation, they are further attacking and take, telling us that they are paying from the West. And I think that they, the Vucic is accountable for, the, for that part. And of course we are working with the government, of course civil society uh, should, government should deliver a change and civil society should be there and help uh, and work with the government, but the key question is how? We should not uh, uh, send the message to civil society that they should be bribed, that they should stop criticizing government, and that they should stop being watchdog uh, uh, organization and have watchdog function. My idea is that we should work with the government, but we, we should uh, have a clear demand how government should be behave, and not to forget accountability of all duty holders. And we know what they, uh, what they need to do, and I think that this is not happening uh, 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 from Vucic's side, and he's trying uh, that to silence more or less all, uh, all critical voices. I, try, I, I will always say that some things that he's doing are very good. I mean, I think that negotiations with Kosovo are, are good and that he's delivering something, not too much, but something. I think that, for example, gay pride was a positive step. I think adoption of some laws were also good and positive step. But out of 100%, this is about 15% or 20%. Okay. Other things that he's doing are not, are not uh, acceptable from my perspective. Brief intervention by Yasmin because I know there's quite a few people. I'll be very quick. I mean, the, 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 I, I tend to be more sympathetic to Goran's point. And to that point, I would just say that we should keep in mind the experience of Mr. Orban and gentlemen like that, which is to say, what is the end game if we're going to deal with people like Mr. Vucic? And I'm not saying that we don't deal with them. Of course we do. But keep and understand that there will come a point where he will perceive that he no longer needs us. And then, once again, he, all options will be on the table. The other thing that I would very quickly say about the uh, uh, Edi, Edi Vucic uh, summit uh, is, to my mind, the Albania-Serbia spat is a little bit like that old joke about Bosnia. You know, like Serbia and Croatia had a war and Bosnia lost, uh, except with, with uh, Kosovo having the role of Bosnia now, which is to say that I'm not really sure what the basis of this supposed Albania-Serbia feud is, but everyone in Europe suddenly rushed in to, you know, prevent this That's war. That's because you're anti-Albanian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. That's the Yugoslavian racism. No, oh, please. No, 
uh, it's it's a non okay. <laughs> I know uh, but <laughs> they might not <laughs> uh, no the, the point is that it's 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 a non issue right and it was it was a by and large a manufactured crisis by Tirana and Belgrade to have this positive 15% uh, you know to end up creating the youth office which is great which is fantastic, but it was once again evidence that these local elites perceive that the proper way to deal with the international community is that you create crises and then the West comes in and solves it for you. Or West keep the crisis like in Kosovo and you don't know what to do with that. Ouch. Obrad <laughs> Kesic. Uh, thank you. Uh, I apologize in advance, but since the RS has been uh, let's say mentioned, mentioned quite a few it, times. Quite a few times. Uh, I have a question. I'll allow you two extra yeah. sentences. <laughs> uh, Obrad Kasich, I'm the director of the Republika Srpska office here in Washington D.C. Um, and uh, first and foremost, let me just clear the air of a few things that were stated here as fact, but are fiction. First. In terms of, we'll the have the truth meter check that. Uh, ho hopefully, they'll do a better job than they did with uh, at calling me to get my opinion on the story that they printed without talking to me. So hopefully, that would be much better than that, and adhere to the code of conduct co conduct that they signed uh, with pointer, uh, because uh, otherwise, it's totally irresponsible and it's fake it's news. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's, uh, but the set aside the personal issue. Uh, we talked about the rule of law. And there was a lot of lip service of that. And you talked about the sanctions. But there's a big problem with the sanctions against Dodik. First and foremost, here in this country, we just had a, a Supreme Court justice nominated. And I've been listening this morning to people talking, Democrats, who say the Constitutional Court, uh, the, excuse me, the Supreme Court has lost its credibility through five to four decisions. What do we say about the, uh, the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina? that not only has it been outvoting out of Serb and Croat judges by Bosniak and foreign, three foreign judges, and this has been crucial decisions that have changed the Dayton Accords. That's, that's credible. So that's the basis of the dispute with President Dodik, but not just President Dodik, because he didn't decide to hold a referendum. The referendum was a decision of the parliament of Republika Srpska in which all of the parties a, including, you can last, laugh, Yasmin, but one of, you didn't mention any of the parties that are on the state level. I think that's intentional on your part because they're doing what you would like them to do. And that's a problem because you are a political activist and you're choosing sides. But that has nothing to do with the rule of law. The rule of law is very clear and straightforward. Everybody has to play by the same rules. In Bosnia, that's not happening. And the Republika Srpska relies on its inter international lawyers to define what international law is, what is in accordance with Dayton Accords, and just because a U.S. ambassador says it's not, or because a Hoyt Yi says it's not, does not make it true. The sanctions that were introduced are introduced at a time when there's an investigation by a prosecutor in Bosnia and Herzegovina whether or not there was a violation of the, of the law. The American embassy and the State Department decided the verdict. They introduced sanctions on a case that's ongoing. It's interference in the judicial process in Bosnia. You should be objecting to that. If you have a problem with uh, Croatia interfering and proposing a plan on constitutional change, you should have a problem with the U.S. Embassy interfering in a judicial proceeding in Bosnia before there is even a decision to indict. I mean, what is the prosecutor going to do? stand up to the U.S. Embassy and the government after sanctions have been introduced? It's ridiculous. Now, the question, okay. I promise. <laughs> Even though there's other things that were said in terms of uh, Carl's introduction, it wasn't Dodik who lined up the soldiers, right? Who, who lined up the soldiers in Banja Luka? It was a member of the Bosnian presidency. Remember you said yeah. you were going to ask a question. Well, here's the question. Given the change here after the election, uh, Trump President Trump has been very clear. The U.S. will now no longer go to other countries and tell them how to run their governments. He also very specifically stressed democratization programs are destabilizing. How do you see your activism in light of what is potentially a change of U.S. policy on providing funds that eventually find, uh, fund your work? 
Excellent question. Before that, you, I, I'm going to apologize, but just two factual things from my part. One is just a reminder that the Constitution, which is part of the Dayton Peace Accords, was signed by the government of Republika Srpska. The Constitution defines the role and the structure of the Constitutional Court. Um, so speaking of rule of law, I think the decisions of the Constitutional Court should be respected. I think you'll agree with me. And on the Treasury decision, I really encourage you to take a look at the wording of it very closely because it does not refer just to uh, the issue of the referendum, but it refers to the obstruction of the Dayton Constitutional Order and Peace Accords over a number of years. But you, you said that the verdict was brought before the case was closed. So the verdict is on a previous cases. Okay. Okay. Our audiences online are not going to be able to hear you. Um, so let's let's give a chance to for Yasmin maybe to respond first. Uh, if you have any reflections on this, very briefly, and then on the questions of how. Uh, w with respect to my colleague's point, uh, I think Ivan, you've kind of made the point. I would just say I'm going to I'm going to pick on one particular construction, which I think is very telling: the notion that international judges and Bosniak judges have outvoted Serb judges and Croat judges. Either there is law, or there is not. Right. So as long as you insist that that is the dynamic on the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina, you yourself fundamentally are admitting that you do not believe in the rule of law. What you believe in is absolutely ethnically constituted law, right? So this notion that, excuse me, the notion that only, what, Serb decisions should apply to Serbs, Bosniak decisions should apply to Bosniaks, that's what I'll say on that front. Uh, as it concerns uh, the notion of what has happened in the United States and the broader process of activism uh, and the notion for that matter of me as an activist choosing sides, of course I choose sides, as do you, as do all of us, right? There's, there's abs I mean, of course I'm a partisan, right? Uh, I make certain arguments on the basis of what I think are the facts and what are certain political options and, and political opportunities and political eventualities that I would like to see not only in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but in the entire region. Uh, I think it is a very negative and potentially disastrous decision for the new administration to, to take the line that democratization programs are destabilizing. Um, if the new administration decides that that is going to be its policy moving forward, uh, from my end personally, that means that I'm going to have to reach out to new international partners and new local partners because I have no other options at that point. I fundamentally believe the values of this republic and this country, and I believe that the best friend that Bosnia-Herzegovina has had is the United States, and I feel it would be a disaster for the United States to disengage from Bosnia and from the Western Balkans. But if that is the decision, of the duly elected government here, of the duly elected White House here, then we will have to go to places like Berlin, as we already go to. We will have to go to new partners and new allies, those who fundamentally do believe in democracy and the rule of law and civil society and activism and the necessity of all of those things. Andre, uh, let me moderate the discussion, please. Andre, you had a... Um, you know, I'm thinking... <clears throat> what, what, what should I say? I understand completely the question how the U.S. change of policy, if that type of a change of policy happened in this manner, as we believe, would influence many other countries. On my personal level, uh, let me tell you, majority of funding for my organization comes from government of Serbia. Um, those people who heard me, what I'm saying about Vucic, they would say he is paying me, but no. Um, but what, what I'm saying is that I really believe that it's not question that this type of understanding where you want your country to belong to should not be connected to the money issue. You know, my background is on the other side. My ethnic background is on the other side of the earth. But uh, it doesn't mean I have connection to, to, to U.S. money, and that's the reason why the political activism is going on. And, you know, there have been cases when U.S. and not just U.S., many Western supporters of, uh, let's say, Youth Initiative for Human Rights, like Norway, decided what just in one day to leave us. 
we survived because, you know, I don't want to make big statements, but I really believe that the Trump is not having anything to do as well as Obama didn't or any other policymaker with what we believe is good and important for our home countries. And additionally, I would say from my point of view, uh, uh, there is no better way to understand local activism in the former Yugoslavia than to take the history, 25 years history of this activism and to bring that experience, as many people in this room asked in the previous weeks, to the existing political situation here. And I would love to say this is my partisan opinion. <laughs> Uh, let me start taking two questions at a time because I'm starting to see lots of hands. Uh, May Tokoloski, I think, uh, was next. And then we can probably take the question right next to him. Uh, Meto Koloski, United Macedonian Diaspora, and thank you so much. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, depressing situation in the Balkans, and it's uh, fortunate that, uh, you know, the carrot stick of EU and NATO, uh, particularly for my homeland, Macedonia, is no longer uh, there, and it's definitely with this administration uh, and everything that's been going on in, in Europe. Um, I'd love for you to perhaps uh, touch on, you know, in the Macedonian community, we have the saying, uh, the, the four wolves around Macedonia and unfortunately over the last two months uh, this has become quite true. Uh, two days after elections Eddie Rama called the parties of the Albanian minority in Macedonia and they developed a platform which the basis of the first three points were focused on ethnic rights uh, and changing the laws of Macedonia to change a flag, the anthem and different things um, and yet you know we thought that probably economic development or prosecuting crime and corruption is probably more important than some of these ethnic um, things and then they announced this platform on Christmas Day uh, in, in Macedonia. So the timing was really bad. Then you have Serbia's uh, foreign minister claim that we've offended our uh, Greek brothers uh, by recognizing Macedonia as Republic of Macedonia one day after uh, New Year's. And then the Bulgarian uh, president said that Macedonia should join the EU, but Macedonian identity should not. Uh, and just two days ago, the Greek uh, prime minister in Belgrade said that Macedonia is not meeting its international obligations, yet the ICJ in 2011 ruled that Greece violated uh, the UN agreement on the name issue. And so it's making it very difficult for us in the Macedonian-American diaspora community. It's making it difficult back home when they're trying to build coalitions, governments that will bring the country forward and get NATO and EU back on uh, the priority. And then obviously with all this rhetoric from the Trump administration lately uh, is not helping. So if you could perhaps comment on some of these uh, developments and, and, and all that on Macedonia. We'll take another question right next to you, Meto. Thank you. I'll stand up. Because I'm um, hello, I'm Dira Cepani. I'm a representative of the Women's Network Equality and Decision Making from Albania. I think I'm the only one Albanian in the room. So uh, I'm, Albanian. I'm glad that Oh, that's great. More ethnic <laughs> Albanians than you think. <laughs> Maybe Albania proper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you for this event. It's uh, very important to discuss about the situation in the Balkans. And every time I hear s a political situation in uh, the different countries of the Balkan, I hear the story of our lives. It's the same uh, everywhere. So uh, regarding to the civil society support, I'm, uh, I do completely agree with uh, Mr. Nosov that uh, the political support is important, but I think that uh, civil society in the Western Balkans, in the Balkans, has shown that is the, the first one and one of the only ones that have shown that cooperation is possible and is important in the Balkans, and they can bring peace and good relations between each other. So I think that apart from political uh, support, I think that civil society support is very important. Uh, in many of the countries, and I'm speaking about Albania, but I think the, the situation is the same in all uh, other Balkan countries, uh, civil society has a lot of pressure, especially when uh, it's being critical. So I think uh, the support from abroad is uh, very important. It's not a matter of funding, as the speakers were saying, uh, were saying before. It's a matter of not feeling alone in the battles that we, that we are fighting all together. So uh, 
thank you for your support and thank you uh, especially to the National Endowment for Democracy for being such a great support for, for this region in the Balkans. And uh, my, my question would be, what, are you, what would be your remarks uh, regarding Albania? It's the only country that hasn't been mentioned uh, during the, uh, the description that you had about the political situations in the, in the other countries, if you have some. Or I may say some, but I would like to hear your, your perspectives of uh, let's those. See, thank let's you. see if the speakers can comment. And thank you for your good work, Aldera. I think we'll stop uh, with these two and, and uh, I guess I'll very quickly speak to the to the Macedonia question. Uh, I mean, look, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the situation in Macedonia is very, very worrisome. Um, the The pattern that you've described, you know, the the quote unquote four wolves or what have you. I mean, look, I think this is a function of the unfinished democratic consolidations of the entire region, right? All of these governments, unfortunately, including in Greece and Bulgaria, which are EU members, um, at various times view it uh, profitable for their domestic audiences to export a certain kind of instability or this kind of you know, nationalist, uh, uh, populist, uh, 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 just sentiment, right? These, these kind of talking points. You know, every few months you just sort of throw a little stick of dynamite in there and, and get things going and distract your domestic audience from whatever is going on uh, in the region at that point. I mean, I think this is why it's, you know, these are to a certain extent fairly comedic episodes, although they have very significant uh, uh, effects, especially on countries like Macedonia and Kosovo and Bosnia-Herzegovina, which, which are, you know, remain sort of perennially unstable or destabilized by these kinds of actions. Um, but this is exactly why we cannot give up on uh, not just sort of domestic democratization efforts, but a kind of regional democratization as well. And I think the second speaker made that good point, right? Like at the civil society level, we have tremendous linkages. We have tremendous networks, right? People from Tirana have no problem going to Sarajevo or to, to, to Belgrade to, to have these meetings, to talk very frankly. And you're absolutely right. We we're all confronted by the same kinds of problems. These are, these are regional phenomena. And so to my mind, you know, when I speak about Macedonia, I have to talk about Bosnia, and when I talk about Macedonia, I have to or when I talk about Bosnia, I have to talk about Macedonia and and the entire region. Because until we create the kinds of mechanisms and we c uh, create the kind of inertia, right, we're never going to see see that wholesale consolidation. And when you create the wholesale consolidation, I think you'll see a lot less of these kinds of silly uh, uh, and, and reactionary and pointless disputes over non-issues, right? This, 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 this Bulgarian idea of Macedonian identity. I mean, it's not only is it offensive, um, but, at the, but the, at the end, it's, I mean, it's also farcical, right? It's a, it's a meaningless statement, but it elicits fire and brimstone. And that's exactly the point, right? Anything on Albania, maybe? <coughs> about Macedonia, I remember that the first signal that something is wrong in Macedonia was that uh, uh, ruling party or ruling parties were controlling media. That was the first country in the in the region that had that such phenomena. And I remember that so many people say, "Yeah, but Macedonia is so advanced comparing to other countries in the region." It was 2007, 8. Uh, uh, so and uh, they don't need other support. That everything will be fine. We should we should trust in, in institutions that are already built and so on. And this is the proof now what is happening in Macedonia that uh, that uh, what we build in on all Balkan countries is very vulnerable. That that progress is not for for granted. I mean uh, that that processes that will go back and uh, much back. I mean are, are are possible. And I'm afraid that this will happen uh, in Macedonia in the long run. What what is very make me how to see almost sad or how to, to explain my feeling is uh, I talked so many times in Brussels about Macedonia and they absolutely people that are involved in, in solving crisis in Macedonia they don't know what to do. Absolutely, they don't know what to do. And I remember one very, very uh, op off the records, but very open and, and honest message. And uh, a guy who is one of key negotiators telling me, I just hope that Americans will, will, will uh, you know, jump in and, and, and help. And this is, this is, you know, this is kind of, uh, of reality for Macedonia. And I think after the elections, we, we hope that elections will solve something. But uh, unfortunately, I don't see that, that much things will be uh, uh, solved in solve the long run. And that is the message from Macedonia, that we need to build institutions and we need to go further. And not to stop to, so at some level and say, OK, this is enough. Mm. 
for that particular country and we should not we should not work further and that that's good until 2020 or 25 let's do it you know let's take it easy so i think that lesson lesson learned from macedonia should be applied to other balkan countries any notes uh, uh albania no one albania spoke like about albania again we should try to do something yeah? uh, uh you know um I'm not so familiar to all of the processes in Albania, but I believe participation in the work uh, uh, on the regional level, which Albania and uh, Edi Rama and his government uh, did, uh, is really good. And I uh, just a little bit coming back to what you said before about uh, Serbia and Croatia agreeing on Bosnia, and Bosnia has uh, lost the game. Uh, and Kosovo, I don't believe this is the case, even though this is the joke. Um, uh, because, you know, in Kosovo we face with a uh, very specific situation where international community is having a lot of power, much more power than we uh, should hope for in 2017 to have. And when I say that, I mean ruling the country, uh, doing and helping uh, still local authorities to build up the country and all of that. And then on the other side, you have uh, uh, big troubles and big problems in this um, uh, regional cooperation efforts when Kosovo is involved because of Serbia's position, with change of Serbia position, with Kosovo position. It happened the other day, and no one actually published that, that Kosovo left some of the regional meetings because they were disagreeing on something, on some decision that some Serb will be put in some um, uh, position as a director uh, somewhere. So what I'm saying it is... It happened in Albania, so we can mention It Albania. happened in Tirana, yeah. <laughs> Uh, with the support of OSC in Kosovo, which is an engagement from Bosnia. So it was really uh, a regional. Uh, a regional effort. But what I'm saying is that this is so important perspective of traveling, which you mentioned, and I would support that, because I it looked like, uh, in a way, crazy. But, you know, I traveled first time to some other country. I don't count and don't remember, like when I was small, in 20s, first time in the neighborhood country, because, you know, we don't travel. So I think we need to change that because, you know, for those older folks in the room, you know, uh, and even those from former Yugoslavia, you know what it means when you could travel, you know, in Sarajevo or in Bosnia and meet people. The biggest trouble in Balkans is that we hate each other and we don't know each other. And that's something what we should, you know, accept as a knowledge. So you have a bunch of prejudice facing people and I think their civil society work was great. You know, you have so many of those mechanisms, so many of them with support of United States of America, especially the private foundations here, uh, which helped many of those initiatives in Bosnia and Serbia, the first time in Kosovo, Serbia relations, Albania was involved. But now we are getting local governments to get on the board. That's great news. And that's something where we should support them, all of them, uh, when they decide to put money and efforts in that type of uh, investment, because that's investing in future vote voters. We should have in mind that voting, 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 and voting is a key issue for our democracies. Yes, of course, institutions, yes, of course, all of those issues, but we still didn't learn to use and practice our democracy as we have it. And we need to work on that. When I say that, I mean, take the media on the elections. You know, you have 30 seconds on national TV in the election time, every political party. 30 seconds. Can you decide, will you vote on this or that for 30 seconds mm -hmm. every day? And this is like bad ruling. This is bad for everybody. Even if they're left or right or whatever, there is no serious debate and serious discussion within society. We have a couple more questions in the back. Let's let's uh, t take more questions. There was one all the way in the back, and then here we'll come back to Rob. Thank you. My name is Gordon Duguid. I'm currently with the State Department's Bureau of South Central Europe. Uh, until last August, I was the Deputy Ambassador in, in Belgrade. Uh, two clarifications before my question. First, uh, Vice President Biden was supposed to meet the opposition. His plane was held up by weather. The uh, meetings with the opposition and civil society in Belgrade took place with Charlie Kupchan, who is his senior, was his senior foreign policy advisor. So it was on the schedule, and unfortunately, weather interfered. 
on the sanctions on Mr. Dodik, this was not a decision by two individuals. The decision to impose sanctions is serious, took long-term uh, debate, and was made at the deputy level in the National Security Council where it belongs. It was a government decision. And then my question is about parliament and engaging the parties. In Serbia, there's one electoral district. 50% of the MPs live in Belgrade, they're from Belgrade, and if you go out, as I did, to many towns, you ask the mayors, um, who do you talk to when you have a problem? And they say, well, unless you're in the SNS, or unless you have a relative who works in the ministry, you don't talk to anybody. In the last elections, um, last spring, you saw a number of mayors change party to SNS in order to be able to get resources for their town. What type of parliamentary reform is necessary? How should uh, outside people who work in the Balkans and wish for success in the Balkans help political parties and parliament develop so you don't have to worry about the three or four people who are at the top and thwarting everything? In, in Serbia in particular, the MPs answer to the party. There is no one who answers to the people at that level. I, I'm afraid this is the case for most of the Balkans. Uh, Rob Benjamin up front here in the third row. Thank you very much. I'm Robert Benjamin with the National Democratic Institute, happily still very much engaged uh, in the Balkans, courtesy of the NED and USAID, and working with, among other institutions, political parties and parliaments. I think all of us are feeling a little whiplashed by the geopolitics uh, within and outside of the region. Um, and, and I am tempted to uh, agree with those who feel that uh, Europe and the United States have lost their grip. Uh, and that other powers, uh, legitimate or, or, or not, are taking up uh, the space. And when it comes to uh, uh, the role of Russia, I think, in Washington, we have to be a little bit more expansive in understanding Russian influence, where I think uh, people here are uh, focusing, as they should, on Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia. But I think we also have to incorporate a larger space uh, to understand this, the entirety of this phenomenon. Um, and that does definitely include uh, the Balkans. And so I say that to my friends and colleagues here in Washington. Um, I probably will play a little bit off some of the earlier comments. Um, we are 25 years into a, what has proved to be an exhausting, elongated, uh, never-ending, it seems, democratic transition. And with those geopolitical factors in mind, and with some of the comments that have made, I would like to ask if it's possible at all to distill a little bit what you see to be the democracy the democratization agenda hmm. for the region at this stage. Um, and I'm thinking about some of the structural issues that we're, we're referencing, such as electoral systems or separation of power or, or sectoral reforms such as the judiciary, the hardware stuff. Uh, but I'm also thinking about the political currency uh, and some of that software where uh, it has to do with relationships between government and political parties and civil society. Or it has to do with the notion of how citizens themselves con con conceive that very identity. Uh, do you have to play the ethnic card as the price of entry into politics? Uh, is that common currency now? If so, I would find that quite sad uh, because it denies other types of, of of political uh, affiliations that can cross over and diminish conflict that has plagued the region. Um, what is it that we need to be focused on? Is it all of the above, or can you distill particular areas? And in that, and going to the point made, uh, and I do have very strong and definite views of the utility of outside assistance groups, not just NDI, but others, but really, where's the meeting point between external support whether it's technical assistance, whether it's solidarity, the meeting point between that and the agency and the activism and the citizenry or citizenship, uh, now more than ever, 
that the countries in the region need to rely on for themselves because of, the, because of so many factors that we're discussing. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. So should we uh, take it in order or? Why don't we let Goran speak first because I think Goran hasn't spoken in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the first question was on the parliamentary system in, in Serbia and uh, what reforms um, Can, can you, you just say for the Biden thing? But he didn't meet opposition. I said that. Whatever the reason was. Okay. So he that's the say whole point. He had his say. Yeah. So <laughs> let's... Okay, okay. I think each, each person had his say and I think, I think the gentleman clarified what happened. Um, the parliamentary system in Serbia and a single electoral district that basically uh, motivates this uh, the idea of accountability of elected officials to their political party leaders rather than, than citizens. Uh, how do you see an alternative uh, parliamentary system in Serbia? What, I what do you think would be the solution? I think that system is quite weak and we the expectations from, I'd say, West, from European Union especially, are quite high when it comes to uh, parliament. And I think that parliament is very weak. It's, uh, it's quite controlled uh, by the ruling party. It doesn't matter who is ruling party, not this one. I mean, it was Democratic Party and so on. And they are transfer of political will of, the, of, the, of that ruling party. Uh, uh, expectations from, that are coming from West, but particularly from EU, is that we as a citizens can influence parliament much more and that there is a po possibility to, ha to have something. And uh, I remember recently that we, when we tried to have some public hearings in the, in the Committee for Human and Minority Rights, a public hearing to different issues, topics, I don't know, minority, national minorities or something like that, and it was like, okay, we want to have one, uh, one hearing, one public hearing, uh, okay, ten, 10 public hearings per year, and they say, it's too much. And you know, you, you are, you're a committee, you're just a committee, you're not plenary session, and I think that the whole system is, is quite vulnerable. I think that the possi possibility to influence, uh, to influence and to do anything uh, is, quite, uh, is quite limited, and when you want to do, when you want to do, to work with the government, you need to do, uh, you, you, are you are working through uh, the key player in the, in the society, in Serbian society. At the moment, that key, key guy is a Vucic, before it was Tadic, and before it was some, some, uh, some different. System, system as such, parliamentary system, I'm afraid uh, it does not, uh, it doesn't exi exist. Uh, uh but any ideas of how to change that, how to change the, the way the, this is what the specific question was. If how to change? It's it's quite uh, it's quite tricky. I mean, there were there were several ideas how to change a uh, parliamentary system. I mean, uh, 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 related to uh, to voting and what system uh, should be imposed. But uh, I I think that all all solutions have good and bad sides. And I think that uh, we will not hear, have any change. I think that uh, uh, this present system. I mean, when when it comes to voting, is the only one that is applicable, unfortunately, uh, in Serbia. So I I don't see any any other. There, maybe there are some some models. I mean, but uh, but all, you will always find some bad sides in those models. Maybe Andre, if you can take that on and also broaden it into this broader question of democratization agenda. That uh, uh, I think it's very important to to uh, you know I'm asking myself and I completely agree with your assessment of the moving to Senate. It happened as well with the um, favorite Boris Tadic before. Uh, that people were moving from SNS to or Serbian Radical Party even to Democratic Party. So any party in, in power, that's our culture. You know, in my hometown, I think the president of municipality has seven of them. So uh, G17 plus, let, uh, let me remember you about <laughs> this, your favorite. Um, so what I'm saying is that this is part of our political culture that people who live outside of Belgrade and that's a question of Belgradizatia, Bel, Bel, how, you know, how you're going to call it. But there is something specific about that, especially in Balkans, because we have still this legacy of former Yugoslavia. And in many other parts of uh, former Yugoslavia, like you have this uh, difference between Pristina and Gnilane. You have this difference between Sarajevo and m many other places. You have this difference even in Croatia between Zagreb and Osijek. You can see that. That, that was part of long-term development of those centers. That's one thing. The second thing is, in our political culture, and I think who, gon who should be changed there are people who are presidents of these parties. Yes, you're completely right. If the MP is not okay with the president of the party, he goes out or she goes out. Or she keeps the mandate and creates some new 
political forum of, I don't want to name how, how it goes after that. What I'm saying is that people do not own seats in the parliament. How to change that? We need to work much more with a higher level, because I don't believe in people's participation in this change. I really don't, because we did that, we tried that. USID spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on working to, on that, and they didn't succeed. So let's move to some other, another strategy. The other strategy should be, let's work with the, with the political parties who are on the table, with their tops to, work, to, to change that political culture, because it's a question of political culture. It's not a question of capacity and capability of people to vote, to participate and do that. They, they're going to find that way. Key thing is, you have the whole mechanism for parliamentary questions, and then you have MPs not asking questions. Why? Who going to take them accountable for that? President of the parliament or citizens? But citizens cannot move them. They can. They. They even cannot call them. I was watching the other days, you know, uh, here at the office, some people calling, you know, in their free time, taking their phones and going around and calling, like, my senator or my Congress representative to argue about something. You know, I, n I don't know who is my MP. You know, there is no my MP. There is a political party for which I voted, and then they eventually have representation. So I believe this is very, very, very important issue. But... I believe the key thing is we don't have will, political will, to change that. Because it goes directly with uh, uh, the context of changing our uh, power plate, which we have in the government. Who is making decision? And that's the feeling which we have that only one, pr because media is control, everything is under this, I would, I would say, connection. So we have the feeling that people don't have power. But then we come to the point that nine activists of Youth Initiative made huge scandal. So what I'm saying is, and I'm just referring to, to Rob's question, I agree with you totally and completely. Uh, and I don't believe anyhow any of the foreign money should pay, and any money should pay activism. You know, the question of activism for better state in Serbia should be a question for us who are living there, not to be on our salary request, you know, be active five days a week. And I don't know anybody who was engaged like that. Maybe there is someone, but I don't know any concrete example. But th what I believe is very important to understand, connecting to this parliament issue, it's really bad feeling when you know that we spend money on a wrong project, you know, and we don't have enough money. What I'm saying is we need much more and much clearer assistance, not just in a question of money and question of foreign aid and how this can be re-evaluated, we as well need to discuss what we did. When I say we, I believe the whole, and there was a very great contribution by Ivana in her book, actually about donors' mistakes. I'm serious, civil society mistakes and donors' mistakes, and I'm using my pencil. Uh, this is very important issue. You know, guys, you were spending a lot of money on reform and then not taking care about supporting those who are against the reform. So, you know, this is not democracy. This is a question of serious evaluation and re-evaluation of the foreign aid at all. Not just the influence and the changes, but what you did. Where are the mistakes? You know, something what we learned from all of those evaluators who were sent from Washington and dealt with us. Serious discussion about, and Balkan is a great example. You know, even, even by the year in which you did the research, we saw so many really, 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 really worrying moments of, of uh, investment in especially democracy uh, actions. And we should consider that very seriously, you know, and not leave it on the side like just mistake. It's mistake, but we need to change it. It's our mistake. Great. Thanks for that plug-in. That was a while ago. Mm -hmm. Yasmin. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to what is the thing that I concentrate on mostly, and, and it's to the, to the last question. Um, I, I do actually, I'll disagree with Andre here, uh, I think transparency and participation are absolutely vital. I don't think there is a clear sense of accountability at all uh, or participation on the part of ordinary citizens. Uh, the things that I've tried to work on, for instance, with the Friedrich Heber Stiftung is actually developing these kinds of platforms for participation, right? We have these activist fora, especially reaching out to some of these sort of more uh, uh, 
militant kids, uh, what we started seeing in Macedonia and, and Bosnia in 2014, right? This, this tremendous sense of resentment and anger at the whole uh, artifice of political uh, uh, power and culture in, 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 in Bosnia in particular, but in the region as a whole and the international community, creating the kinds of uh, 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 venues and platforms for them to come in, to have a day where they can call you every bad word in the book and then they get it out of their system and then you go, cool, so what do we do now? And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, oh, oh you actually want to know? Like, yeah, I don't know if we can do it, but let me hear it. Like, let me actually help you formulate policy demands, right? So that's number one. And, and, and this, is, this is also something that, that relates to the, the parliamentary question, right? I mean, uh, you know, there, I think Andre raised the point very well, you know, this notion that you get 30 seconds on, on television to make your point. I mean, why, why don't we have, you know, debates, right? Candidate debates actually happening on television on a, on a, on a level that, that, that needs to be elevated, right? I mean, why don't people in this region know who to call, right? I mean, these are... Uh, we, the, the, what, we, what we talk about in, in when we talk about civil society in this region is really still in the sort of like germ stage, right? Like we're still in the stage of fundamentally building a civil consciousness or a civic consciousness, I should say, right? The idea that if you are disgusted with the way politics is being done, uh, it is beholden on you and it is your responsibility to activate yourself and demand change. Now, there's a lot of structural barriers to that, I grant, but this is something where I would absolutely agree with Andrea. At the end of the day, the responsibility is on people on the ground from the region to demand those kinds of changes. I think the role then that in the international community can play is creating platforms and creating venues and creating forums. Uh, I do not expect the United States or Germany or the United Kingdom or whoever else to change Bosnia-Herzegovina. I do hope and plead for the United States and other international actors to help us build <coughs> those forums and, and, and those participatory institutions and avenues. That's where the conversation begins and kind of ends for me, right? That's, that's the sort of the thread that runs through it. I have to say to their credit that our colleagues from the National Democratic Institute both uh, tried uh, the candidate debates and continued to employ that as a method, as well as constituent offices, and if I remember correctly, in at least a couple of countries, which sound like this uh, mechanism for contact with parliamentarians. Any other questions? Jim Hooper. Mic microphone is right behind you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Jim Hooper, Syrian Emergency Task Force. Um, if, and that's Syrian Emergency Task Force, not Serbian Emergency <laughs> Task Force. Uh, that we might need soon. one of those. That's <laughs> Iberia, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, that's coming soon, Andre. Um, if the United States wish to prevent Republika Srpska from leaving Bosnia, what would you recommend as the most effective steps that the United States could take, realistically using the least possible effort? Great, and let's take another one. There's a gentleman right there. My name is Petru Hogan from the Embassy of Bulgaria. I, I just kind of um, felt invited uh, uh, by hearing, by hearing Bulgaria and uh, the farce uh, policy that we have toward the uh, uh, Republic of Macedonia um, and the notion that uh, we allow, um, we support the accession of uh, Republic of Macedonia uh, to the EU, but uh, without uh, its identity. So it's, um, of course, I, I cannot uh, agree, and uh, I think this is a kind of a, a blunt, direct uh, accusation that uh, kind of a pri um, provides a too simplistic uh, um, view of the uh, the open issue that we have between Bulgaria and Macedonia. Uh, I just want to say uh, that Bo Bulgaria is the the first country that uh, recognized the independence of Republic of Macedonia and with its constitutional name uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and we supported it throughout these years, including with military hardware in, trou in troubling times. Uh, our end um, strategy is to see a prosperous and democratic Macedonia as part of the NATO and, and the EU. Uh, and uh, I would just say that uh, what has been said about um, 
the, public, the remarks by the president is, I, is something that I cannot find or I'm not uh, aware of. Uh, president uh, Ivanov visited uh, Sofia right after the elections, uh, the presidential election that we had in November, and he met both with the uh, then president and the, and the newly appointed uh, one. So this is just a sign that uh, Bulgaria takes a very pragmatic and uh, open approach to, to Republic Macedonia. We we'll hope that we'll be able to overcome the, the, the open issues. Thank you. Uh, Any comments on, brief comments on that if you have? I don't want the back and forth, please. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I uh, respectfully, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take the point as it were. Uh, I, I do, I do think that that. I mean, it's perhaps a question better answered by the by the, uh, the person who originally posed the question. I will just say that I think there are continuous uh, the level of discourse and dialogue as it concerns these kind of explosive questions of core national and state identity in the region as a whole are at an unacceptable level, uh, and they continue to be politicized for the most reactionary and really uh, uh, cynical and partisan ends. I think that's, that's all that needs to be said about that as a, as a general climate. Um, and, I, and I do think I would, you know, again, we go back to the civil society. I think when you go at the level of civil society discourse, we don't have these issues. These are not the conversations that are happening. Uh, we need to ask ourselves very seriously why it is that at the political level, these are the kinds of questions that are being asked. Um, to the question about uh, the potential for RS secession, uh, and, and I really appreciate the way you phrased the question about the notion of what's the, what's the most bang for our buck, as it were. Uh, I think the most bang for our buck is name and shame very clearly, right? Uh, notwithstanding the decision that was taken by the Treasury Department, uh, which was long, long overdue, uh, for too long, it has been uh, the policy, not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the current government and the RS, but in the political establishment in Bosnia Herzegovina in general, that people are allowed to say all kinds of scandalous and incredibly destabilizing things, and for the international community uh, to come out with very blase statements, right? Uh, I think it's not sufficient to state simply that you know the United States or the your EU or what have you, you know, remains committed to Bosnia Herzegovina's Euro-Atlantic perspectives. The statement that was released vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the sanctions was much much better because it not only identified the causes for why this decision was taken, but also that the United States was committed to the territorial integrity of Bosnia-Herzegovina, right? That makes it very clear what we're talking about. Um, that, I think, if it is done consistently and clearly, and I really do commend the current embassy staff and, and the current team in Sarajevo right now in the US Embassy, I think they've done an excellent job, uh, that if this is done consistently, we will not be in a situation where we will have to ask five years from now what else needs to be done. And I also, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm a little hesitant to go too much further down that road because I don't think the secession th threat in the RS is credible. Um, I don't think there's an infrastructure for war. I don't think there's an infrastructure for the kind of conflict that would be inevitable if such moves were taken. And moreover, if and when we get to that point, the sort of regional and geopolitical dynamics that will be at play will be so much larger uh, that it doesn't really make sense to 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 talk about uh, y you know as 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 taking steps right now. I mean, yes, I would like to see a larger EU and U.S. military presence in Bosnia Herzegovina, if only an extra hundred troops, just to make that <laughs> statement. For instance, as what we've seen in the Baltics and Poland as of late. Uh, but again, that's, that's expecting something that I realize is not realistic at that point, uh, or at this point, I should say, uh, which is why, again, I go to clear, clear name and shame statements of what the stakes are and that the United States <coughs> unequivocally <coughs> stands behind Bosnia-Herzegovina as a sovereign state in its current shape. Do you want to answer something? Yeah, I, I just want to disagree. Uh, <laughs> that there just is came no, back. Uh, yeah, no, no, but that I don't believe that this no war infrastructure uh, argument stands. Uh, I'm on the other side. I believe that uh, you just need a fire and you're going to have it in the whole region. So I don't believe that the threat is not so serious. And then I, I'm going to use the other argument, which is Kosovo-Serbia relations in the north of Kosovo. 
and the whole uh, the whole idea of um, how to say relations between border police and the other and the, the the train case and everything what happened actually in the previous I would say year and a half after the Brussels agreement started with moving back by Serbian uh, authorities from the north part and with uh, unclear discussion within the international community what happened with this division of Kosovo idea uh, and how it's possible that in the end so fastly there is no any more big incidents on the bridge wow how how it's possible who controlled then the bridge incidents wow and let's ask the other questions so what i'm saying is key thing is to and i agree with you shame and blame for the, all of those who want to see again blood around balkans whoever they are and whatever their position is and i think that should be uh, a clear message and clear you know statement and on a policy level you know we should not be so tolerant for the small signs because i will remind you about 1989 and 90s when people even maybe half of this room were saying like oh this will not happen this will not happen no chance in the end 120,000 people died we had genocide we had many destroyed lives families this is our responsibility thank you andre Last round of questions, Daniel Server, and then we'll go in the back. Daniel Server right there, right behind the pillar. Daniel Server, I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins, SICE. It's good to see you all. Some of you I know in cyberspace. <laughs> uh, a comment, which I'll try to keep the five sentences. I've been generous. I haven't heard from you, and I admit I had to step out for a few minutes, any reflection or appreciation on what the change in the American administration means for the Balkans. So I'll offer you my view, which I'm entitled to because I'm not at NED or NDI or IRI. We have an ethnic nationalist administration now one that is not committed to equal rights under the law. And I think you have to think very carefully about what that means once it's reflected into foreign policy, which will take months, admittedly. Uh, and before you plead too much for American hands-on, I would argue that our losing our grip is exactly what we should have been doing to some degree. It's a question of the pace at which we lost it and the ways in which we lost it. But we didn't support sovereign, independent, territorially and integral states in order for us to be able to boss them around. In the end, the responsibility has to be with the Balkans to sort this out. And I think you're going to see an American administration quite different from previous ones, which will make your lives in some ways much harder and in some ways much easier. Thank you. One last question. <laughs> All the way in the back. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Benjamin Kisson. Um, I came in slightly late, so I don't know if this has already been mentioned, but uh, my question was on uh, Vetvendosia in uh, in Kosovo, um, and Yasmin already sort of touched upon engaging with more. Uh, I don't want to say militant social movements, but um, what uh, there's there's been a tense history between uh, the embassy, the U.S. embassy in Pristina and and Vetvendosia. Um, but as the party and the movement gain steam, how should um, how should U.S. policy change in terms of engagement with with that movement? Any last question? Anybody else just dying to ask a question because this is it going once, going twice. 
Uh, well, let's not do that <laughs> because there's a lunch, there's lunch waiting for us, and I, <laughs> speaking, I know one person has to um, uh, take a, a little break, and I really have to eat lunch too. <laughs> so, uh, let's start with uh, the veteran dossier questions. To give you ask me in just a second to, to run out. Um, and I should answer the veteran dossier question. Why not? Why not? <coughs> you go way back with, uh, <laughs> with those guys. <laughs> yeah, I like Harbin Kurti. Um, you know, I think U.S. should engage with everybody. I don't see the point in not engaging with veteran dossier or anybody else. But, and just to connect that to Dan Sever question or statement, I see your point uh, and uh, yeah, but when I say engagement of Washington, I just don't think U.S. as a institution, State Department and all of those, we need help and support not just from the official Washington, D.C. And you've been, in a way, putting us on the third level of your table, not the first and the second as we were there, which is understandable having in mind what, what's going on. But um, I, I really believe that engagement for me, when I say and recommend engagement of U.S., it goes jointly with some clear positions. And that's the biggest trouble. Because general positions about democracy, rule of law, everything what we heard from US officials, and we heard it for years, it's not enough. Good and bad guys should be named good and bad guys. No specific terminology definition unit at the embassies. And that's something what, what I really believe should be there. And good and bad processes. For me, it was unbelievable watching back representatives of uh, uh, U.S. Embassy speaking and supporting people who attack human rights defenders in public sphere, who attack free freedom of media. And I can understand from the point of connections and communication and trying to control things to speak with them. But I don't believe in support. And I would remind you of some of the great American ambassadors' efforts to tell us, to tell to, for example, Serbian public that they are bigger Serbs than the Serbs are. So this is, from my point of view, wrong strategy. Doing marketing from that point of view of policy is not something what I believe we should see from, from U.S. institutions. And I have in mind, coming back to the veteran dossier, just to conclude this whole thing, should we speak to extremists and all the others? I do believe in dialogue. And I believe, and I always speak with people who are complete opposite to me. I was actually, the other day, encouraging Anita Mitic from Youth Initiative to go on TV on the, with the most awful journalist, and I'm using this wording, in Serbia, who is running the, the worst tabloid ever, to go with him on TV Pink in Belgrade and to fight with him. Because I believe this is needed. It's needed to say and state out, and that's the place where I believe our responsibility comes from. Uh, to, to one end, because Serbian nationalists are my problem, not U.S. problem. Serbian radicalization, potential war, everything what we are saying, it's not your problem unless you are not engaged in a way uh, we believe you should be engaged. So what I'm saying is no one is not giving to U.S. responsibility for our lives. I don't give you that. Uh, but I'm just saying don't, don't mess with us in lack of understanding or lack of engagement. And that's something what I can say to my American friends. We've seen that in previous years. Even it was not official policy, even it was weather or whatever, you know, we saw that. We saw many, 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 I would say, bad steps in this situation. And support to some people who do not deserve that support. Anything to add, Goran, in, in your concluding uh, remarks? Two hours ago, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned when you asked me why we failed, why all our investment failed, I mentioned one of the reasons is that uh, message is not clear and strong. And that's what Andre mentioned. I mean, message must be clear and strong. I'm dealing with human rights. And, you know, when someone from abroad is coming to, to see any government, Serbian, Bosnian, Macedonian, and they say, you know, what about human rights? I mean, they say, well, we are respecting the highest level of human rights. What about rule of law? Yeah, we believe in the rule of law. That's, that's, that is not working. I mean, or democracy, or free elections. You cannot tell them, you, you must be specific what you expect by free elections. Andre mentioned also that it's very important. I agree fully. Free elections are, are crucial for all Balkan countries. And 
how to achieve that with, with such media? No, it is not possible. If you don't have access to media, it is not possible. If opposition parties, I'm not in any political party, but it is not possible for opposition party to do anything if they don't have access to media and to funds. If funding of opposition party are not good. So this is the message we need to pass, something very clear and very strong that is from, from uh, United States and also EU must pass that message. If messages are very general, we will, not, uh, we will not achieve anything. And I think this is the, this is the thing that uh, uh, should be done in the coming period, especially now when they expect that th those messages will not happen anymore. So the time of clear messages or strong messages are passed, you know, they, they can play any, uh, any game in the future. I think that uh, particularly now that things are uh, important, that you know, you're coming with very, very strong, uh, with very strong messages about with whom you should talk, I mean, we should talk to everyone, I'm talking to everyone in my, in my country, in any country, we should talk to everyone, but it depends how we are dealing with, how we are engaged with someone, how, not if, we should, we should talk with everyone, but the key message is methodology, what you will do exactly, uh, with, exactly with whom, and what you will tell, uh, tell everyone. And to be honest with, uh, with all of you, of course, some of you uh, may know, there are a lot of prejudice by Balkan politicians. They, they think that they can uh, or either bribe, I mean, foreign people from abroad, or they, they think sometimes they have such a stereotype and prejudice that people that are coming from abroad are stupid and that they can, that they can uh, trick and play games with them. I don't think, I don't, I don't believe that, but I heard so many times that they are sharing such prejudice and stereotypes uh, uh, with, uh, with, with me particularly, and the, the best thing to deal with that is to, to pass a very strong and clear message. Okay. And the last message, <laughs> speaking of messages, Yasmin, maybe reflecting again on these two. Yeah, questions. definitely. I mean, um, to the point about the, the, this notion that there's now an ethno-nationalist in the White House. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not an American. Uh, it's, not, it's not my job to, to, to tell the people of the United States um, what that will mean for them. I think it's very clear what it will mean. I think this country is, if not on the you know, if it's not already there, it's certainly on the pre precipice of a constitutional crisis. Um, and it's something that we have to understand also in a global context. Um, I think it would be a millennial mistake for us to abandon the core democratic values, norms, and principles that have made the United States what it is. And however, uh, 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 you know, imperfect it has turned out to be. Uh, what has taken place in former overt authoritarian areas of the world like Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans. Um, I am a critic. I have issues. I have problems with particular policies, with particular policy agendas. Um, <coughs> but I am absolutely committed and unwavering in my commitment to democracy as an ideal. Um, for this region that we're discussing today, but also as a global order. Um, I think as it concerns the question of who should we be talking to, I think we can talk and should talk with everyone, uh, provided we're doing so in an honest and transparent manner, uh, provided that as many people as possible are involved in those conversations and we're always building structures for broader conversations, and also that we make it clear that there is a difference between if you want to put it in these terms, free speech and hate speech. I don't mm. think it's appropriate uh, to let off gas canisters in the parliament. Um, I also don't think it's appropriate to use all manner of reactionary and chauvinist vulgarities as a manner of everyday political speech and to whip up sectarian resentments and to pretend on the part of the international community that, oh, we don't see that. Um, I think, again, I go back to the point of naming and shaming. I think we have to understand that democracy is not just free elections, it's not just free speech, it is, entire, it is an entire complex of values, norms, institutions.